pero ya, ya. ya. Muy buenos días a, to a todas y a todos. Bueno, Fer, Muchas bien, gracias bien. por su asistencia a esta tercera jornada del Seminario Internacional sobre Hans Kelsen, un diálogo desde el contexto actual. Antes que nada, deseo agradecer a los profesores Pedro Salazar Ugarte, Francisco Ibarra Palafox, Javier Hernández Manríquez y Julio César Muñoz Mendiola por la oportunidad de participar en tanto eh, coorganizador, eh, ponente y también como moderador de este evento. El día de hoy eh, estamos acompañados por panelistas de lujo, por panelistas de alcance internacional. Y eh, iniciaremos esta jornada con la conferencia magistral de la profesora Sara Lagi, que tendrá una duración aproximada de 40 minutos, mientras que el periodo de preguntas y respuestas será de 20. Posteriormente, eh, tendremos la intervención de todos y cada uno de los participantes, de los ponentes, y al final tendremos otro periodo de preguntas y respuestas. Cada participante, cada ponente, posterior a la conferencia magistral de la profesora Sara Lagi, tendrá aproximadamente un periodo de tiempo de 20 minutos para poder exponer eh, sus consideraciones. Eh, dicho lo anterior, me permito también recordarles que pueden ustedes expresar sus preguntas a través de la página de Facebook Live del Instituto de Investigaciones Jurídicas de la UNAM, así como en el chat de esta reunión. Eh, me gustaría presentar a la profesora Sara Lagi, primero en español y después en inglés, para cederle la palabra en este día. La profesora Sara Lagi es catedrática asociada de Historia del Pensamiento Político en la Universidad de Turín, Italia. Es miembro de la Sociedad Europea para la Historia del Pensamiento Político, la Sociedad Italiana de Derecho y Literatura y de la Asociación Noreste de Ciencia Política en los Estados Unidos de América. Desde el año 2000 es miembro del Laboratorio Americano sobre Estudios Constitucionales de la Universidad de Goyas, Brasil. Ha publicado numerosos estudios monográficos sobre Hans Kelsen, George Jelinek, Adolf Fischhoff e Isaiah Berlin. Zara Lagi is Associated Professor of History of Political Thought at the University of Turin, Italy. She's member of the European Society for History of Political Thought, the Italian Society of Law and Literature, and the Northeastern Political Science Association in the United States of America. And since 2020, member of the American Laboratory of Constitutional Studies of the University of Goyas, Brazil. She has published monographic studies on Hans Kelsen George Jelinek, Adolf Hitchhoff, and Isaiah Berlin. Thank you very much, Professor Zara Lagi, for your participation and welcome. Uh, gracias por esta gratita invitación. Uh, and uh, sorry, but I have to speak uh, to speak in, in, in English for my um, presentation. I would like to share with you the slides of my presentation and uh, please tell me if you can uh, see them. Can you see them? Yes, Professor, we can see okay. you. Thank you very much. So as I was telling you before, I promise I will not exceed 40 minutes for my presentation. Um, the title of uh, my speech is, as you can see on the slide, Hans Kelsen's theory of constitutional justice as an anti-authoritarian choice, issues and controversies. As uh, you have already just heard, I am not a legal theorist, I am not a philosopher of the law. In my approach to Hans Kelsen, uh, both as a political thinker and as a constitutional theorist, is an approach of an historian of political, uh, of political thought. 
So what I am going to propose you and my speech is to look at Kenzen and to look at his theory of justice from another perspective, which is not the classical and traditional perspective of those studying uh, legal, uh, legal theory. Uh, and assuming, as I do, the perspective of the history of political thought, the major question, one of the major questions for me, concerns the role and relevance of Kelsen's constitutional justice theory within the tradition of European democratic thought, in particular during the first post-war period, when, as you know, he published his most relevant works, not only on constitutional justice, but also on democratic theory. Well, uh, just to start, I would like to uh, identify and focus a little bit on what I define as three elements of complexity from my perspective about Kelsen's theory of constitutional justice. What are these three elements of complexity, complexity at least for me? The first element of complexity consists in the fact that in my opinion, chiefly between 1919 and 1920, when Kelsen gave his personal contribution to the making of the Austrian constitutional process, well, at that time, between 1919 and the early 20s, in Kelsen's mind, constitutional justice, his Verfassungsgerichtsbarkeit, was uh, uh, seen, I mean, it was seen by him mainly as an instrument to preserve the unity of the new Austrian state instead of uh, like an instrument to preserve democracy as a form of government. The second element of complexity consists instead in the fact that, in my opinion, until the late 20s, until the late 20s, Kelsen never made the political content of the constitutional justice, of his constitutional justice theory, really explicit. In my opinion, the very first uh, important writing in which he made the political content of his theory of constitutional justice truly clear, truly explicit, was his La Garantie Jurisdictionnelle de la Constitution, which was written and published between 1928 and 1929. And let's go to the third element of complexity, which is the most interesting to me as an historian of political thought. The third element of complexity, in my opinion, refers to the fact that if we take into account his major writings on democratic theory, and I'm specifically thinking on the two editions of his Von Wesen und Werte der Demokratie, we will immediately notice that in none of his writings on democracy, Kelsen mentioned openly his theory of constitutional justice. Obviously, you could immediately, as legal theorists, you could immediately reply to me that uh, the lack of such mentioning was coherent, was in line with his uh, pure theory of, of the law. But for me, as an historian of political thought, this kind of uh, answer is, is, is not enough in the sense that, in my opinion, as I'm going to argue in my speech, there is instead an interrelation between his democratic theory and his constitutional theory. And more exactly, I'm going to argue uh, that, uh, in my opinion, his writings on a democratic theory include some interesting a key of interpretations to access from a political point of view to his theory of constitutional justice. So summing up, starting from these three elements of complexity, I will argue in my speech that when analyzing Kelsen's constitutional justice, there are three Kelsen's to take into account. And in a few minutes, I will explain you better what I, what I mean by three Kelsen's. I will argue that his theory of constitutional justice had a strong anti-authoritarian implication. I will argue that even though not explicitly, his theory of constitutional justice, just for its strong anti-authoritarian implication, is perfectly functional to his democratic and political vision and vice versa. And just reflecting on this third aspect, I will argue what I think are some interesting controversies uh, Kelsen's constitutional and democratic thought poses to all of us today. So I am 
we'll proceed with, uh, with order, in order. And so we'll start to reflect a little bit on uh, the so-called first two Kelsens in the middle of a political storm. Uh, by the term of first two Kelsens, uh, I'm referring, uh, generally speaking, I'm referring to Kelsen's role within the Austrian constitutional process. The whole uh, Austrian constitutional process uh, between 1919 and 1920 was deeply marked by the frontal clash, by the frontal struggle between uh, social democrats and Christian socials for determining the future of the Austrian Republic. And one of the hottest issues uh, debated between social democrats and Christian socials at that time was basically federalism versus centralism. In the sense that social democrats uh, were pushing for the creation of a centralized state, whereas uh, Christian socials, along with uh, the representatives of the major lenda of the major Austrian regions, were instead pushing for a federal state. And behind these two clashing views, there were two diverging ways of interpreting the foundation of the new Austrian state. On the one side of the barricade, we had social democrats who basically um, advocated, who basically uh, said that uh, the uh, creation of the new Austrian state was following the, uh, how can I say, was uh, following the assumption of full sovereignty by the National Provisional Assembly, whereas Christian socials, along as the representatives of the major Austrian regions, said the opposite. They instead said that the new Austrian state was created, uh, was created thanks and uh, um, through a contract, a Vertrag, between the National Provisional Assembly on the one hand and the regions, the lender, on the other hand. But the most interesting thing to say about, uh, the most interesting thing to observe within this debate between social democrats and Christian socials was the fact that one of the issues addressed during the debate was about the introduction of the constitutional, of the constitutional court. It was uh, Karl Renner, who was uh, the leader of uh, social democrats. He was a dear friend to Hans Kelsen, and he was also the chief of the National Provisional Assembly, it was just Karl Renner who proposed to uh, introduce a constitutional court, which had to be the Republican version of the old Habsburg Reichsgerichtshof. In other words, the leader of the Social Democrats stood in favor of a constitutional court which would I'm quoting from Karl Renner's speech at the National Provisional Assembly, occupy itself not only with the protection of the citizens, but also with state provisions, the freedom to vote, and our public law." End of quote. Um, why are these words interesting to me? Because from my uh, peculiar perspective, these words show us how relevant discussing about a constitutional court was at that time in Austria. And it shows us also that when addressing the creation of a constitutional court in the first Austrian Republic, it was not only a matter of applying a more or less legal theory to the constitutional text. It, also, it was also a matter of recalling to the past of the Habsburg Empire in the sense that, as I have just told you, Renner was proposing to create a constitutional court which had, had to be the new Republican version of the old Habsburg uh, Reichsgerichtshof. Keep also in mind that if we look at the history of the Habsburg Empire in the late 19th century, we can see that at that time there was an interesting uh, theoretical scientific discussion about the Verfassungsgerichtshof. And two of the leading figures of that discussion were Karl Renner and Georg Jelinek. Okay, now I would focus on these first, on the first of the two Kelsens I was mentioning. In February 1919, the uh, Constitutional Assembly was uh, elected, 
just in 1919, Carla Renner hired Kelsen. I mean, Kelsen was put in charge of writing six constitutional drafts. And while writing these drafts, basically Kelsen had to imagine a federal Austria as well as a centralized Austria. But most importantly, during summer 1919, Renner, who was the first president of the Austrian Constitutional Assembly, realized that within the game of reciprocal compromises between social democrats and Christian socials to define the political future of the nation, the federal options seemed to gather to receive the major consent. And this is why he asked Kelsen to imagine a federal constitution and the role of that a constitutional court could play within it. Kelsen did, I mean, imagined this federal uh, uh, constitution, imagined a Bundesverfassungsgerichtshof, a federal constitutional court whose task could be to be appealed only by the Bund, only by the federal government against unconstitutional laws of the regions. So the point in my opinion is that if we look at this uh, attempt of imagining a Bundesverfassungsgericht um, uh, for Austria, we can see that behind this, uh, this, this model, behind this proposal coming from Kelsen, there was a clear anti-lender, anti-region prejudice just because the right, uh, uh, the right of appealing to the court was recognized only to the region, uh, only, only to uh, the federal government and not to the region. So what I want to stress is the fact that looking at this proposal, at this specific proposal, the fuller reciprocity between Bund and Lender in appealing to the court was not recognized yet. And here, here, Mm, just, uh, I mean, during the summer of 1919, between 1919 and 1920, the second Kelsen I was mentioning comes on the stage. Why? Because if it's true that the first Kelsen was basically the prominent, distinguished consultant for constitutional affairs hired by Renner, and if it's true that this first Kelsen was uh, basically engaged in uh, receiving the inputs, the political inputs coming from Renner, it is also true that between 1919 and 1920, Kelsen, as a theorist, uh, as a legal and political thinker, as an Austrian citizen, took a clear stand, took a clear position on the constitutional, on the ongoing constitutional process in Austria. And I am referring specifically to um, a couple of essays that he published between 1919 and 1920. The first is entitled Die Stellung der Länder in der künftigen Deutsch-Österreich, which translated more or less sounds like the position of the regions in the contemporary German Austria. And the second essay I'm referring to is the Vorentwurf der Österreichischen Verfassung, the draft of the Austrian Constitution, 1920. Why mentioning these two writings about the so called Second Kelsen? Because here Kelsen made two interesting things for us. I mean, on the one hand, he imagined, he uh, figured out. Two possible, three possible scenarios, sorry, three possible scenarios for the future of Austria. He imagined uh, an Austria with a federal system. Then he imagined an Austria with a centralized system. And after that, he imagined also an Austria with, uh, with lender, with the regions provided with a large administrative autonomy. But most importantly, in both writings, he made explicit his personal position about the debate on the future of the country in the sense that uh, in both writings, he openly said, he openly argued that in his opinion, the true essence, the true nature of the new Austrian state was not contractual, but instead it was fully unitary, so he basically opposed 
to the idea promoted instead by Christian socials and the representative of the regions according to which the new state had been created through a contract, a Vertrag, between the central institution and the region. So if all this um, information are uh, clear, now, what I wanted to stress about what I have told you so far is, is this. In my opinion, when discussing on uh, the Austrian Constitutional Court, when discussing, I mean, on the Constitutional Court in relation to Kelsen's contribution, uh, the focus of these two Kelsen's I have mentioned so far was uh, more, more on the problem of the unity of the state and its preservation rather than on the issues related to democracy and its uh, defense. And most importantly, as I have tried to stress and argue, Kelsen's contribution to the writing of the constitution cannot be detached from the concrete political debate between the two major parties of the country. However, after two big conferences of the lender, which took place in Salzburg and Linz, and after a long and complex confrontation between conservatives and socialists, not only the federal solution prevailed, but also along with it, the principle of a full reciprocity between the central government and the regions in appealing the constitutional court. Kelsen accepted and could not do otherwise the principle of a full reciprocity between central regions in appealing the court, but it did something more. As we know, he introduced the innovative principle of ex official procedure. The ex officio procedure was, uh, as you know, the principle that established the primacy of constitutional law over the federal law and over the regional law. Obviously, you as legal theorists could immediately observe that uh, such a principle was uh, once again in line with his legal theory, I mean, identifying as cats indeed, the state with a legal order, with a legal system. Uh, implied that uh, all states' functions, including uh, the central and regional legislative processes, could be subject to legal control. But in my opinion, regardless with the absolutely righteousness of such, uh, uh, of such, uh, of such a thing, I think also that uh, uh, the X, uh, I mean, behind the principle of the ex officio procedure, there was also the, uh, how can I say, the strong, um, the stronger commitment and the belief that uh, constitutional justice in Kelsen's mind could be at that time a good instrument to preserve the unity of the new Austrian state. And uh, the third Kelsen, at the beginning of my speech, I mentioned the three Kelsons. I have already referred to the first two Kelsons. And what about the third one? The third one comes on stage in the late 20s with the publication of La Grancie Jurisdictionnelle de la Constitution, which, in my opinion, was the writing, was the essay in which Kelsen made the political content of uh, the political, I mean, uh, the uh, pro-democratic content of his uh, theory of constitutional justice truly explicit. Um, it was telling at the beginning of the speech that one of the most interesting uh, things to say about Kelsen's theory of constitutional justice, at least for me, for an historian of political thought, is to observe that in none of his uh, writings on democracy, there is a reference, a clear reference, to his theory of Verfassungsgerichtsbarkeit. Well, uh, what I think is instead that his writings on democratic theory, and more precisely, the two editions of his Von Wiesen und Werte der Demokratie, can offer us some interesting interpretative keys to access to access to his uh, theory of constitutional justice from a political point of view. 
So now what I want to do uh, with the time at my disposal is to focus a little bit on some of the key components of his democratic theory as it emerges from uh, the first and second edition of the Von Wiesen und Werte der Demokratie. In both editions, uh, Kelsen started from, uh, one, from, uh, from one basic assumption. He started from um, identifying a clear cut distinction between real and ideal democracy. When talking about ideal democracy, Kelsen uh, referred to Jean-Jacques Rousseau and uh, le contrat social. Why Jean-Jacques Rousseau? Because uh, for Kelsen, Rousseau was the greatest legal theorist who, much better than other ones, uh, had been able to uh, explain, to grasp and explain the ultimate sense of uh, an ideal democracy. An ideal democracy, as Kelsen argues, an ideal democracy is that a democracy in which we obey laws that we have directly made. So in other terms, ideal democracy, according to Kelsen's reasoning uh, inspired by Rousseau's lesson, an ideal democracy should correspond to a direct democracy, but but taking inspiration from another major author, Max Weber, Kelsen adds that the complexity of the social system, of the social order within which we all live prevents us from establishing a direct democracy. And so a real democracy can only be an indirect representative and parliamentary kind of democracy. And it is just here, and this point of view is a reasoning that Kelsen poses himself and us a crucial philosophical and political question. And this crucial and political and philosophical question is more or less the following one, in my opinion. How can we continue to be equal and free within a real democracy? Or said in other words, how can we reduce soft often limit the burden of autonomy within a real democracy. In what sense the burden of autonomy? In the sense that within a real democracy, as Kelsen argues, the split between rulers and ruled will always exist. And so the major challenge for him, the major philosophical, theoretical, political challenge is to understand how to reduce this split, how to as I have just told you, reduce and soften the burden of the throne. For Kelsen, the solution is inside real democracy itself, in the sense that according to Kelsen, the best way to reduce a such burden, the burden of heteronomy, is to prevent, or said in other words, is to uh, make laws being the outcome of a true compromise between the majority and the minority. I mean, uh, the best way for him to reduce the heteronomy, to reduce the burden of heteronomy, is to prevent laws from being the expression of a mere diktat of the majority against the minority. And the best way to prevent it is to have a true dialectic between the majority and the minority within the legislative body. A true dialectic between the majority and, and, and the minority, which for Kelsen represents what? Represents the expression of that process of integration characterizing real democracy, a process of uh, social and political integration, which is able to do what? Which is able to change the, the extreme social ideal and political pluralism characterizing social body into laws binding the whole social body. But to avoid that those laws are perceived as the mere dictate of the majority on the minority, it is essential, according to Kelsen, to um, protect the dialectic between the majority and the minority inside of the legislative body. 
the legislative body, which is uh, in, in Kazan's democratic theory, it is the legislative body to play the crucial political role. Now, if you look at the slide, you will see that I put a quote, a very brief quote. I will read it. The constitutional court can be effective an effective instrument into the hands of the minority to prevent the majority from violating its constitutionally granted rights. By this way, the minority can oppose to the tyranny of the majority. This quote comes from La Garantie Jurisdictionnelle de la Constitution, but if we didn't know that uh, it comes from La Garantie Jurisdictionnelle de la Constitution, or we could be inclined to think that it's a quote from Fonvesa Nutferta de Democratie. So what I want to tell you is the fact that uh, here, in this passage I have just uh, quoted, we find uh, the true threat d'union, fil rouge connecting his democratic theory with his theory of constitutional justice. The true challenge is to make the dialectic between the majority and the minority properly work within the legislative body. Because in, 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 in his opinion, this is one of the best, uh, this is one of the true instruments we have in our hands to soften the burden of, uh, of, of, of heteronomy. But in order to make this dialectic properly work, we need another instrument. And this other instrument is the constitutional court. So in other terms, what I want to tell you is that in my opinion, in La Garantie Jurisdictionnelle de la Constitution, constitutional justice is depicted by Kelsen as extremely relevant to preserving the compromise, the dialectic between the majority and the minority, and therefore the compromise between the majority and the minority as an essential part of democracy itself, real democracy. And it's, uh, it's just in this point that in my opinion, we can better realize, we can better grasp that Kelsen is offering us, is providing us with a double kind of political justification of constitutional justice, a liberal justification and a democratic justification. By liberal, I don't want to, I'm not referring to being liberal according, for example, to North American uh, way of, uh, I mean, Weltanschauung vision, I, when, with, with the term liberal, I'm referring to uh, the century long tradition of uh, liberalism as, as a school of thought, as a tradition of the philosophical, of the philosophical thought. Well, in my opinion, I repeat you, Kelsen provides us with uh, a double justification of a political justification of constitutional justice, a liberal justification and democratic justification. From a liberal perspective, constitutional justice serves to impede the tyranny of the majority. And I'm using this uh, Tocquevillian term deliberately, uh, Kelsen himself speaks about tyranny of the majority. And from a democratic perspective, impeding the tyranny of the majority is essential, in his opinion, to make the minority count during the legislative process, in order to make laws a true compromise rather than a diktat of the majority, and thus in order to soften the burden of the of heteronomy. But uh, so what we can say at the end of the game, we can say that uh, by softening the burden of heteronomy for Kelsen, we can get closer to ideal democracy, which can never be carried out. But even though it can never be carried out, he thinks that we can get close to it. And this is a way to get close to it. So in other terms, in my opinion, taking into account his work on uh, democratic and political theory helps us to uh, access and to, um, to access from a political point of view his theory to his theory of constitutional, uh, of constitutional justice. Okay, I have still at my disposal uh, a few minutes. I'm going to run. Okay, in this last, uh, very last part of my speech, I would like to share with you some very personal reflections on uh, some issues and controversies emerging from uh, Kelsen's uh, democratic and constitutional uh, and constitutional theory. In general terms, uh, 
We can say that Kelsen's work on constitutional justice was a turning point in the history of Eurocontinental legal and political thought. But I, I know that it was not only for Europeans, but now I'm thinking of the reality I know the best. It was a turning point because uh, in many different respects, we can look at uh, Kelsen's legal theory as an attempt to go beyond the traditional split between uh, power and law, which had always characterized the European rule of law system in a theoretical, intellectual and practical, practical terms. But it was a turning point also because we should, uh, we should keep on mind that chiefly after the end of the Second World War, Kelsen's work on constitutional justice was a point of reference uh, for many legal theories, for many intellectuals. I am thinking on, for example, the Italian constitutional process after the end of the Second World War within the Italian Constitutional Assembly, one of the most frequent mentioned names was, uh, was, was, Kelsen's, was Kelsen's name. But uh, at the same time, just uh, looking at uh, Europe after the Second World War, when, uh, when, 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 I mean, when a, in, in period, in historical period, which was characterized by the promulgation of many democratic uh, of many democratic constitutions, most of these are European constitutions, including mine, including the constitution of my country, um, included strong principles and strong values. And why is it important to remind of this? Because uh, Kelsen was uh, always against inserting strong principles and strong values into the constitutional text. The Italian legal theorist Luigi Ferraioli uh, has argued that this is the reason why, in his opinion, Kelsen was never able to develop a coherent theory, theory of constitutional justice. But beyond and regardless, beyond uh, Luigi Ferraioli's reflection on this kind of issue, I would like to conclude my speech just reflecting and focusing a little bit on the problem of the values within Kelsen's uh, democratic and constitutional, uh, and constitutional theory. Kelsen was always uh, against the idea that absolute universally valid values do exist. He thought that values being a human product are always mutable, changeable, and uh, relative. And to this idea, this, uh, his personal idea of, of values can be related to his, uh, for example, to his legal theory and chiefly, in my opinion, to his frontal critique of natural law. By rejecting natural law in the name of a strict legal positivism, Kelsen was uh, advocating the immanence essence, the immanent essence of positive law, whose validity, as we know for him, depended on the way it was produced rather than on its correspondence to some sort of a principle or value. And mutatis mutandis, in my opinion, he developed a similar kind of reasoning when addressing politics and democracy. Values uh, had to be seen in their immanent, in their being immanent, a human product, plural, mutable, changeable, and dem democracy was therefore that particular form of government which recognized, in his opinion, the immanence and mutability of values, and therefore their being relative. This is why in all of these works uh, on democracy, Kelsen defined relativism as the proper belt and shang of democracy, which appeared to him as the most suitable to philosophically sustain the rights of freedom and chiefly freedom of opinion, freedom of press. So what I want to tell you is the fact that um, Kelsen's acceptance of uh, relativist outlook, uh, in his opinion, a relativist outlook made parliamentary practice characterized by the majority and minority dialectic uh, conceivable and feasible and moreover, the lack of strong values and principles in the constitutional text prevented the constitutional judges from becoming hidden legislators and therefore contributing to the safeguard, to safeguard their, their, their true task, that of monitoring the observance of the constitutionally funded procedures, making parliamentary di dialectic and thus democracy work. So what I want to tell you is that in my opinion and from my perspective, there are two fil rouge connecting his democratic theory with, with his theory of the constitutional justice. The first fil rouge is the 
idea of protecting the minority against the tyranny of the majority. And the second, Phil Rouge, is his relativist outlook. And here, just to conclude, I would like to just reflect a little bit on the controversies arising, in my opinion, just from his relativist uh, Weltanschauung. In what sense? In the sense that uh, the first problem about Kelsen's uh, extreme pro-relativist uh, attitude um, is the fact that uh, the interrelation he establishes between a relativism and tolerance is, in my opinion, far from being auto-evident. Why? Because being convinced of one's belief, for example, I know the religious one does not necessarily imply to be against the beliefs of other people. And after that, a relativist attitude in some respects might generate potentially intolerant behaviors towards those who are not uh, relativist. But most importantly, in my opinion, Mm, his uh, extreme pro-relativist attitude brings him to undervalue some key questions. And, uh, this quick, and these quick key questions are, in my opinion, the following ones. For example, what happens if values and principles promoted inside and outside of the legislative body are too different? What happens if political actors in the parliament and citizens in society embody and profess unconceivable values and project, uh, projects. Uh, what happens if a pluralism so much and coherently defended by Kelsen as a blueprint of any democratic government turns out into a puzzle of groups of different orientations and aspirations focusing exclusively on their own specific specificity identity and only interesting in claiming special rights even to the detriment of, uh, of other groups. I mean, all these questions uh, remain, uh, are not explained. I mean, uh, he, he, he doesn't address, he didn't address such a crucial questions uh, for a variety of different reasons, obviously, but in my opinion, also because, uh, he, uh, because of his extreme uh, relativist uh, uh, attitude. So to conclude, what I want to tell you is the fact that from, from the perspective of an historian of political thought, it is useful, it would be useful to critically address, and I know that there are many important intellectuals who have already done this, but however, it is useful to critically address his pro-relativist attitude, not to replace his belief in immanence or mutability of values with some sort of dogmatism. But rather to consider that maybe even recognizing the mutability and immanence of values, the true political challenge is to reflect on the importance of identifying, to use Isaiah Berlin's words, a common horizon, beyond which the mutability of values becomes unacceptable if we want to live in a civic coexistence. Thank you for your attention. Eh, gracias por vuestra atención. Thank you very much, Professor Zaralagi, for this interesting lecture about an aspect that is not uh, well known in Latin America. In fact, we have um, a problem with their reception of Hans Kelsen is the lack of order. And you give to us an important instrument in order to continue the studies of this approach on Hans Kelsen. We have uh, 15 minutes to the period of question and answers, and we have two questions. First of all, of the areas mentioned before, I mean, of these three Hans Kelsen, uh, which aspects do you consider that are necessary to continue studying? And uh, the second one is, is Kelsen's concerns regarding the opposition of constitutional justice and federative organization 
are reflected in the current European constitutional crisis? And a third question, uh, is Kelsen's concept of political pluralism leading to constitutional justice may be equivalent to the current concept of legal pluralism or it differs somewhat? The, this is the, the questions, uh, Professor Sara Lagi, and uh, thank you. Thank you. I will try to uh, give a global general answer to these interesting um, questions. Uh, first, uh, when mentioning three Kelsens, uh, I am simply using this term to uh, identify um, the three moments, three particular stages, the three phases of his uh, contribution to the making of the Verfassungsgerichtsbarkeit in Austria. And uh, um, the constitutional crisis, well, I don't, I'm sure that you know that um, chiefly in, 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 in recent times, uh, um, Kelsen has been taken into consideration as an interesting point of reference to address uh, European constitutional, uh, constitutional crisis. I, what I think is that, uh, I mean, his position about uh, the Austrian constitutional process and his position about constitutional justice should be, but this is a problem for me as an historian, should be contextualized. What I want to tell you is the fact that obviously for a legal theorist, the most important thing is to pick up that aspects, that components of his thought that can be, for example, applied or not applied to the current situation. But for me, the major problem, the major challenge is to contextualize his reflection on that constitutional justice. And by context, contextualizing it, I can see, I can observe that uh, chiefly in the early 20s, talking about constitutional justice meant for Kelsen, reflecting on a way, on effective way to do what? To preserve the intrinsic unity of the state. Why? Because he was really convinced, he was really convinced that regions with their federal aspirations, could put the unity of the state in danger. He was really convinced of that. So what I want to tell you is the fact that it was not only a matter of uh, a prominent intellectual who received inputs from uh, Renner and from uh, the central institution. It was also a matter of an intellectual who really believed that the Verfassungsgerichtsbarkeit was the coherent instrument, the most effective instrument at that time to preserve the unity of the new state. Political pluralism, legal pluralism, that's a big question. I mean, Kelsen as a political thinker and also as a constitutional theorist, as you know, set a great value on the concept of pluralism. And when he speaks about pluralism in his mind, in, he, in his mind, in my opinion, he is thinking about social pluralism, political pluralism, ideal pluralism. What he says, for example, in the Hauptprobleme der Staatsrechtslehre of 1911, is that society is a plural body and that the only unity that we can have is a normative unity. But if we stay on the political level, we have to manage plural, we have to manage the plural entity of the social body. And in his opinion, democracy is much better than other forms of governments and it's much better than autocracy because the blueprint of democracy is, in his opinion, the ability to integrate such pluralism rather than to eradicate or eliminate it. And this is, for example, one of the, one of the reasons, in my opinion, behind his querel, his dispute with Karl Schmitt. His dispute uh, between, with Karl Schmitt was not only a matter of saying, I, am agree, I agree with the constitutional court, I do not agree with the constitutional court, there is much more. It was a dispute between two individuals uh, who had a diverging idea of uh, how a democracy works. And it was uh, most importantly, a dispute between two intellectuals who had uh, two completely diverging attitudes towards the issue of pluralism. I don't have much time at my disposal, but I want to conclude simply by making a reference to Kelsen's critique of uh, Trippel. In uh, the second edition of Unvesen und Vete der Demokratie, uh, Demokratie, Kelsen addresses uh, Trippel, who was 
one of the major intellectuals of the Weimar Republic. Trippel was absolutely against political party pluralisms. And what Kelsen says, he says that instead preserving a political party pluralisms, pluralism is one of the key components of a true democracy. And who wants to say that a democracy can exist without pluralism is not talking about democracy. So I don't know if my, my answer is clear. Thank you. Yes, Professor, thank you very much. The answers were interesting and clear. And we are glad for your participation and hoping uh, having this kind of opportunity in the future and continue with the discussion of one of the most important law thinkers, uh, such as Hans Kelsen. Thank you very much, Professor. Gra gracias. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Mille. Ciao. Gracias. Ahora continuaremos con el ciclo de ponencias e iniciaremos con la ponencia de, los profe de la profesora Mónica Zalewska y Karsten Heidman. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mónica Zalewska and Professor uh, Karsten Heidman. We are going to start with your participation. First of all, I would like to read uh, a brief reference of your extraordinary uh, academic career, first in Spanish, then in English, and then we can start. I would like to remind you that each participant have more or less 20 minutes. And after all the participations, we will have another uh, round table of questions and answers. Thank you. Eh, la profesora Mónica Zalewska realizó un postdoctorado en la Facultad de Derecho y Administración de la Universidad de Lodz, Polonia, y se especializó en la teoría pura de Hans Kelsen. Su estancia de investigación de cuatro meses en el Instituto Hans Kelsen, así como su cooperación posterior, resultaron en su designación como corresponsal internacional del Instituto Hans Kelsen en Polonia. Es autora de dos libros y varios artículos sobre la teoría pura de Hans Kelsen. Se ha especializado en dos campos en particular. Intenta arrojar una nueva luz sobre su pensamiento filtrándose a través de teorías actuales de otros ámbitos, como la teoría de las metáforas conceptuales o la teoría de las relaciones metafísicas como la supervivencia o la fundamentación. El segundo campo está relacionado con la teoría de la democracia de Kelsen. Su objetivo es reconstruir el vínculo entre la teoría pura del derecho de Hans Kelsen, la teoría de la democracia y los valores que son comunes o fundamentales a ambas. Dr. Monica Zalewska is a postdoc at the Faculty of Law and Administration, University of Lodz, Poland specializing in Hans Kelsen's pure theory. Her four-month scholarship at the Hans Kelsen Institute in Vienna and later cooperation resulted in her being appointed as Polish international correspondent of the Institute. Dr. Monika Zalewska is the author of two books and many articles regarding Hans Kelsen's pure theory. She specializes in two fields related to Kelsen. She attempts to shed a new light on his thought by filtering uh, through current theories from other domains, such as the theory of conceptual metaphors or the theory of metaphysical relations like supervivience or grounding. The second field is connected with Kelsen's theory of democracy. Dr. Monica Salewska aim is to reconstruct the link between Hans Kelsen's pure theory of law, the theory of democracy, and the values which are common and fundamental for both theories. Thank you very much, Professor Monica Salewska. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, because I'm not sure if my mic is uh, on. Yeah, yes. 
All right. Quite clear. Should I start or uh, are you going to present Professor Heidemann right now? Uh, if you consider adequate, we can start with you and then with uh, Professor Karsten Heidemann. Of, if you are agree, I can continue with the presentation of Karsten Heidemann. What yes. do you think? Okay. I think it will be better to present each of us because this okay. is joint presentation. Okay. De igual manera, me gustaría eh, presentar al profesor Karsten Heidmann. Eh, guten Abend, Herr Professor. Herzlich willkommen. Danke sehr für diese Möglichkeit. Wir sind sehr froh, weil wir über Hans Kelsen sprechen können. Danke sehr und herzlich willkommen. Karsten Heidmann estudió Derecho en la Universidad Christian Albrecht de Kiel. Escribió su tesis sobre el concepto de la norma de Hans Kelsen bajo la supervisión de Robert Alexi. Desde que fue publicada bajo el título de La Norma como Hecho en 1997, ha publicado diversos artículos sobre la teoría pura del derecho, centrando su atención, entre otras cuestiones, en la concepción de competencia y validez de Kelsen, así como el estatus de la teoría pura del derecho como teoría de la dogmática jurídica. Además, ha publicado artículos sobre temas de la teoría de Alexi y Habermas, también sobre la pretensión de corrección, discurso de la teoría del derecho y la concepción de John Searle de realidad so social. Hasta ahora ha tratado de reconstruir racionalmente la filosofía neocantiana contenida en los escritos kelsenianos de los años 20 del siglo pasado, así como el espíritu de la filosofía analítica con el propósito de alcanzar una concepción factible del normativismo es corresponsal internacional del Instituto Hans Kelsen. Desde hace más de 20 años ha trabajado como abogado litigante especializándose en migración y derecho de asilo. Karsten Heidman studied law at the Christian Albrecht University in Kiel. He wrote his thesis on Hans Kelsen's concept of norm under the supervision of Robert Alexi. Since it was published under the title as the norm Altatsage, the norm as fact, in 1987, he has written diverse papers on topics from the pure theory of law, focusing, among others, on Kelsen's conception of competence and validity, and the status of the pure theory as a theory of legal dogmatics. Besides, He published papers on themes from Alex's and Habermas' theory, like Law's claim to correctness and the discourse theory of law, and uh, on John Searle's conception of social reality. Just now, he aims to rationally reconstruct the new Kantian philosophy contained in Kelsen's writings from the 1920s in the spirit of analytical philosophy in order to arrive at a philosophical possible conception of normativism. He is an international correspondent on Hans Kelsen Institute. For more than 20 years, he has been working as a practical lawyer, specializing in immigration and asylum law. Thank you very much, Professor. Today, um, we would like to talk about grounding in Hans Kelsen neo-Kantian uh, theory of law. And um, obviously, there is not su no such element as grounding in uh, pure theory of law. At least Kelsen didn't mention such. Uh, our aim is to, um, to explore the possibility that perhaps such relation uh, can be found in Kelsen's uh, theory of law. Before um, we move to uh, clarifying whether, whether grounding exists, uh, we would like to explain what grounding is. And grounding is uh, a cont contested concept. Um, we reconstructed it in a way which would be Uh, compatible with uh, Neo-Kantian's theory of law and came to conclusion that grounding then um, has following features. First of all, grounding answers the why question. 
and uh, its intuition is connected to the terms by virtue of or because of and especially by virtue of is something which we might suspect that grounding exists there. A ground is something which somehow determines or makes the second thing exist and be the way it is. So that's the definition of ground. And um, grounding is non-causal relation. So it's uh, different from causality. And the main feature why it's different from causality is it's a synchronicality because in causality we have a sequence of events. Events don't happen in the same time, while in grounding they do. Uh, grounding is dependency, relation between valid judgments or facts, and uh, both elements of the relation, they either exist in case of facts or are valid in case of valid judgments. This is so-called factivity condition. Uh, grounding is asymmetric, transitive, and irreflexive. And the ground is metaphysically prior, prior in the sense that it is conceivable that it exists or is valid without the grounded element existing or being valid. But at the same time, the grounded element can be inferred from the full ground. This is called paradox of grounding, and I would like to we would like to stop a bit at this uh, point. Uh, how this paradox works? Uh, so, first of all, the first assumption is that it is not conceivable that the grounded element is given without the ground. But uh, while and it is conceivable that the ground exists without the grounded element. But if the ground fully determines the grounded element, then uh, it must be possible to infer the grounded element directly from the ground. So here we have a contradiction because this contradicts the claim that the ground is conceivable without the grounded element. But there is some solution to this paradox, uh, which is hyperintentionality. Um, the definition of hyperintentionality is that two concepts are hyperintentional if they have the same extension in all possible words, while this might be not might not be exchanged for each other in every context. Salva verite. For instance, um, being an equilateral triangle and being an Equilanger tri triangle is uh, a case of hyperintentionality. So now um, let's move to the most essential question: uh, Why we decided to explore uh, the possibility of grounding in Kelsen's pure theory of law? First of all, Kelsen sees a gap between is and not, and uh, but at the same time. Uh, he also sees some dependency relation between is and not. For instance, in positing act or efficacy, uh, he sees some, some links. So the question is what kind of link is between is and not in, in such cases or any other? Perhaps it's grounding. So uh, this is one of possible candidates. Uh, why uh, from all possible candidates we chose grounding? Well, because he used images and terms related to grounding jargon, for example, Grundnorm. Well, that uh, sounds um, very familiar to grounding. And also construct of the basic norm gives a hint that maybe there is some grounding involved. Basic norm answers the question of the why of the validity of legal system. Also, higher norms, according to this vocab Kelsen's vocabulary, ground the validity of lower norms. And uh, the legal system consists of hierarchical layers, which is also typical for grounding. So for these reasons, uh, we decided that it might be worthwhile to explore the possibility that grounding theory can explain parts of Kelsen's pure theory of law in Neo-Kantian framework. So 
Now we would like to explain a bit uh, Kelsen's new Kantianism to have this glossary which we will use uh, completed. Uh, Neo-Kantianism is prominent uh, in Kelsen's writing between 1920 and 1934. And as a starting point, we can uh, take, for instance, the passage as soon as we can no longer assume objects to have transcendent, that is knowledge independent existence. Cognition has to play an active creative part in relation to these objects. It is cognition itself which creates its objects from the material given to it by the senses according to its immanent laws. Hence, in short, uh, the cognition um, uh, creates the object of the cognition. There are some consequences of such approach. Uh, first of all, the most important metaphysical unit is cognitive judgment, which, which, what is which is important for our analysis. Secondly, the theoretical ph philosophy of metaphysics is theory of science, which means that legal philosophy is theory of legal science. Finally, its tasks, task is to uncover the necessary presuppositions of scientific judgments. And such assumptions have an impact on central legal concepts. So in this framework, we can say that the general norms are identical with hypothetical judgments of legal science, imputing a sanction to a condition of a general level. And every legal concept must be derived from these judgments, their conditions or their consequences. And for instance, person is just a set of general norms with specific content. Secondly, imputation is identical with legal ought and is cognitive category, so-called relative category a priori. Um, uh, it's a priori, uh, a priori concept of understanding and its status is analogical to causality. The validity is understood in terms of existence of the norm and its validity is cognitive judgment. Finally, uh, competence norm are judgments of a meta level stating criteria for the validity of normative judgments of lower level. After uh, completing this glossary, um, we distinguish some candidates for grounding. So some suspicious, cate the categories which can be suspected that they involve grounding. And I will introduce first three of them and Professor Heidemann will introduce uh, from four to eight. Let's start with higher and lower norms. So um, our, uh, how we decided to proceed, first we defined relation, how this uh, relation, uh, relation of being suspected to be grounding uh, can be defined, and then uh, we uh, collected pros and contrasts. So in case of higher and lower norm, the relation uh, is defined as any legal norm is valid only because it was posited in accordance with criteria specified in another higher norm. The higher norm is the source of the lower norm. So there are some pros um, that perhaps uh, here grounding takes place. First of all, the higher norm is according to Kelsen explicit wording, not just a condition, but the ground for the validity of the lower norm. Secondly, uh, there, we have a relation of dependency between these normative judgments. Thirdly, uh, the lower norm is valid by virtue of the existence of the higher norm and by virtue is a strong indicator of grounding. For then the relation is irreflexive, transitive and asymmetric. Finally, the higher norm could exist without the lower norm, but not vice versa. So it is more fundamental. Well, so far so good, but there are some contrasts. First of all, 
the first contra is conceptualized in question is grounding able to capture the relation between meta and object level. So uh, behind this question uh, uh, is hidden the intuition that the higher norm is about the lower norm by stating condition of its validity. Uh, so it's of logically higher order, but in case of grounding theory, the object level is more fundamental than meta level. So somehow the order here is reversed, uh, which is at least bizarre for grounding. Secondly, higher norm constitutes the validity of lower norm, but it does not determine the content of the lower norm. So we believe that in order to talk about the grounding, uh, this content part would be uh, also very important uh, in, uh, in uh, determining that grounding exists. Finally, the higher norm grounds the lower norm only if the factual criteria named in the higher norm are fulfilled. This means that the higher norm has an entailment structure so that the grounding seems to be superfluous. Now, the second candidate is the basic norm and legal system. The relation is defined as the basic norm is a norm which as the highest norm validates the constitution of any legal system and does the whole system. And basic norm is necessary presupposition as soon as any legal norm is taken to be valid. So there are some pros. First of all, we have the relation of dependency between basic norm and legal system. Then we have uh, semantics and also the fact that the basic norm or grund norm is the basis of the legal system. Thirdly, a uh, basic norm ultimately answers the question why the norms of the legal system are valid. And this relation is transitive, irreflexive and synchronical, which also fits to grounding characteristics. There are some contrasts, however. Well, first of all, only constitution is grounded directly by the basic norm. And this means that this relation is the same as the relation between any higher and lower norm. So we go back to the problems presented uh, in the first case. They occur here, almost all of them occur here as well. Secondly, the basic norm is valid only if the legal system is valid. Uh, and this means that the legal system and basic norm are equiprimordial. So you cannot have one without the other and both cannot be deprived from anything else. So the condition of metaphysical priority is here um, uh, rather suspected to not to be fulfilled. Thirdly, the basic norm does not determine the legal system. We have possible partial solution, discarding ground independence and asymmetry as necessary grounding features, which would mean that we would have to make further manipulation with the term grounding. And per a peripheral imputation. We define this relation as the legal category of ought, a normative link which is analogical to causality, and this link is between condition and consequence inside the hypothetical judgment of the general norm. And imputation connects sanction with some state of affairs. And as the basic norm uh, form of legal necessity, its status is analogical to that of causality. So what are pros that imputation might uh, have something to do with grounding? First of all, it's, the, it's a relation of dependency between judgments. And there is a sanction because of the delict. So again, we have indicator of grounding. And it is synchronical, uh, unlike causality, and seems to be asymmetric. However, there is one big contra. 
Because imputation is a connector on the level of if-then structure, a general rule. So the condition of activity is not fulfilled. This is um, some hypothetical um, uh, some proposition. Um, there might be some partial solution that um, the relation of grounding would occur if both condition and consequence have materialized is x is spanish because he has stolen however this is not compatible with kelsen's near kantian preference of hypothetical cognitive judgment as a basic metaphysical unit and he's locating imputation on the level of self judgment so this was my part. Uh, now I will um, let Karsten Kaidemann to uh, present other um, candidates for grounding. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, okay, I'll just start where Monica left um, and try to share my screen. I think that Monica has to stop sharing her All screen. Right. Uh, it worked previously without me stop uh, without stop sharing, but I can do it. But just oh yes, seems to work. Um, can you see the screen and hear me? All clear. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's my task now to examine some less obvious uh, candidates for a grounding relation. The first one is the relation between the primary norm and the secondary norm. Um, to put it simple, the primary norm is, according to Kelsen, the general legal norm which empowers an organ to impose an act of coercion if there's a certain behavior of some individual and some other conditions are fulfilled. Um, for example, if somebody steals and some other conditions are fulfilled, the judge ought to sentence him. And the secondary norm is a norm correlated to this norm. It commands a behavior which avoids triggering the empowerment to sanction. In the example, it would be a norm forbidding everybody to steal. How could there be a relation of grounding? There is, according to Kelsen, a dependency relation between these norms, while the primary norm is more fundamental. The secondary norm might be extracted from it, but it is deposable. A reconstruction of the law can do without it. The relation seems to be synchronical and asymmetric, they exist together, and the primary norm is the basis for the secondary norm, but not vice versa. Finally, the primary norm fully determines the secondary norm, or so Kelsen says. However, there is one serious flaw. If the secondary norm is nothing but a reflex of the primary norm, a superfluous auxiliary construction, which might grudgingly be admitted, but which is no necessary element of law, then the relation seems to be one of reduction, not of grounding. How might this objection be countered? First, one might say that the secondary norm is not superfluous, but that it captures the intuition connected with the law in everyday practice. According to everyday practice, law forbids stealing, and the norm empowering a judge to punish a thief only comes second. Besides, the secondary norm is not simply a reflex to the primary norm, Rather, it needs external criteria to determine its content. The primary norm as such just gives us a set of equal conditions which must be fulfilled for the judge to be empowered to pronounce a sentence. There must be a delict, but there must also be an indictment brought in, and the primary norm alone does not tell us which of these conditions are subject of a secondary norm. But then if there are criteria external to the primary norm necessary de to determine the secondary norm, can it still be a case of grounding? We touched upon this problem of grounding before. I will say some more words concerning it in the end. The next relation is that between a partial or whole normative system and a person. As is well known, the identification of a person with a set of norms is a major topic of Kelsen's writings in the 1920s. He takes especially the state as a person to be identical with the legal system as a whole. Holding the state to be an independent entity is for him, the result of a hypostatization, which is rooted in outdated metaphysical thinking. So why might there be a relation of grounding? First, there's a relation of dependency between the person and a complex of norms, with the norms being more fundamental. 
law can do, according to Kelsen, without the notion of a state, but there can be no state without law. If we allow for the concept of a state at all, the relation is synchronical and asymmetric, and the legal norms completely determine the state. But then the law being identical with the state does not really answer the question of the why of the state. Again, the relation rather seems to be one of reduction than one of grounding. To say that the state exists by virtue of the law presupposes that, on the one hand, it must be possible to infer the existence of the state from the existence of the legal system. On the other, there must be some difference between them, lest the demand of irreflexivity be violated. So it rather seems to be ground, to be reduction than grounding. Well, the next possible grounding relation is the one between an act of will and a norm. Um, it is another well-known theorem of Kelsen that every legal norm depends on an act of will. It is the objective meaning of an act of will directed at human behavior. Now, does the act of will ground the legal norm as an objective meaning content? To answer this question, we must know what an act of will is and what an objective meaning contained is. Kelsen has very different opinions about what a will is. He oscillates between taking the will to be a normative construct and holding that it is an internal psychical process. The most plausible solution is that an act of will is an utterance according to which the utterer wants some action to be done. If the act of will is norm positing, then its utterance purports to fulfill the conditions for a norm with a certain content to come into existence. That is its subjective meaning. If the act as a performative is successful, then the norm really comes into existence. It is the objective meaning corresponding to the act of will. What are the arguments for the relation between the act of will and the norm to be one of grounding? First, there is again a dependency relation between them. With second, the act of will being more fundamental. The act of will as such might exist without the norm, while the norm needs the act of will to come into existence. And the relation seems to be asymmetric and irreflexive. Also, it is no strain of language to say that, for example, thieves ought to be punished because the legislator said so. Still, there are objections. First, the demand of synchronicity is not satisfied. It is a point stressed very often by Kelsen in distinguishing between the act of will and the norm, that the norm continues to exist or be valid, even if the act of will which triggered it is no longer existent. Second, saying that the act of will is the ground of the norm so that the norm might be inferred from it seems to violate the is-ought dualism. As early as 1920, Kelsen was adamant in the point that there is absolutely no way of deducing norm from the fact that somebody gave a command. Quote, if we trust the common parlance, it might almost seem as if the last ground of an ought must always be an is fact, be it the command of the state, the sovereign prince, God, conscience, or reason. Apparently, it is always a fact which the question after the why of an ought hits upon. But this is only an inaccurate and sloppy use of language deceiving us about the logical relations. It is not because God, the conscience, or reason commanded it that I ought to behave in a certain way, but because I ought to obey the commands of God, conscience, or reason." Unquote. As Kelsen puts it in a bit awkward way, the act of will is only the conditio sine qua non of the norm, while the higher norm is its conditio per quam. Third, a related point, although the act of will determines the content of the norm, it does so only by confirming to the criteria named in a higher norm, so that the grounding relation would not be a primitive intrinsic one, but a derived one, for it is constituted by a general law. Next, the um, relation between a factual act and a legal act. This is not the same as the relation between the act of will and the norm triggered by it, rather, it is the relation between act as part of natural reality and the same act in its legal guise. This relation between natural fact and legal fact is especially interesting because it is named quite often as an instance of a grounding relation by grounding theorists. But is it one? Let's take an example. There might be as part of natural reality the process of someone leading somebody else into a room and locking him up. That process is as such normatively neutral. But interpreting this process by using the legal system as a scheme might yield that the act is the crime of dep deprivation of liberty, which would be a legal act in a wide sense, or the enforcement of an adjudication, which would be a legal act in a narrow sense. 
Is this a case of grounding? The certainly is a dependence relation between the elements with the factual act being more fundamental. It can exist without the legal act or without being a legal act. But the existence of the legal act is bound to the existence of the factual act. The relation is also asymmetrical and synchronic. Still, there are again some flaws. First, um, um, well, the most urgent problem is again that the factual act is a legal act, not by virtue of its empirical features as such. These features are normatively completely inert. It is only by employing a norm as an interpretive scheme that there is any connection between the natural properties of the act and its normative import. But can it be a case of grounding if there's no intrinsic relation between the elements of the relation? It seems at first sight more plausible that there is a grounding relation between the norm used as an interpretive scheme and the legal act, which as such exists only by virtue of using the norm as a scheme. Yet this would neglect the necessity of there being a natural act in advance, which can be interpreted as a legal act. An alternative would be to regard the norm used as a scheme and the natural act as partial grounds of a legal act. But this would again disregard that these elements play their role on quite different levels and fly in the face of the claim of grounding theory to provide a finer grained dependency relation than traditional models are able to deliver. In the end, it seems that the relation between a pure natural act and the same act in its guise as a legal act can better be described as one of supervenience. The strictly formal relation of supervenience can be captured by the slogan, there can be no difference in A, the su supervening element, without a difference in B, the subvening element. This seems to suit, for it really seems to be the case, that there can be no difference in some acts being a legal act without a change in the natural properties of this act. Finally, I come to the last candidate for a grounding relation, the relation between the modally different indifferent substrate and the norm. The modally indifferent substrate is one of the most colorful inventions of Kersen and a long-lived one. It makes its first appearance in 1916 and has a prominent place even in the posthumous general theory of norms. It is that which the categories of is and ought are applied to. Given that Kersen takes the spheres of is and ought to exhaust the realm of the knowledgeable, the status of the substrate is somewhat dubious because it belongs to neither of the spheres. Kersen explains it in two different ways. According to the first, the substrate is some illogical empirical content without object quality. It is the chaotic material provided either by the sensual perception in the case of the is sphere or by the acts of will of the lawgiver in the case of the ought sphere, which is transformed into the system of nature or into the system of legal norms by natural and legal cognition, respectively. According to the second interpretation, it is some state of affairs, a possible fact, which can be denominated by a that clause and which is the content of is and ought judgments, namely that which either is or ought to be. Which are the points in favor of the substrate grounding the norm? First, it determines the content of the norm. Second, it can be detached from the norm, but the norm cannot exist without it. Third, in the general theory of norms, Kaysen uses the metaphor of the substrate being like a cherry stone constituting the core of the whole cherry, which is the norm. This seems to point to that special branch of grounding that takes the grounded element to be the ground in a certain guise. However, there are again flaws. According to the first interpretation of the substrate, the relation between the substrate and the odd is comparable to the relation between intuition and concept in Kant's philosophy. Isolated, they make no sense. They are interdependent and only when taken together, there is an object, a norm. It is oblique to say the least to see a grounding relation between these elements, which are no objects and the norm. According to the second interpretation, the substratum seems to have as a possible fact, a more tangible mode of being. But again, if it does not belong to the spheres of is or ought, the existence neither of a natural fact nor of a legal norm can hardly be said to be given by virtue of the substrate. Being precognitive, it is not able to fulfill the demand of activity. To conclude, the sobering result is that despite Kaysen's use of grounding vocabulary, there's not one clear grounding relation to be found in the new Kantian conception of law. This is not only due to the peculiarities of the pure theory, but also to internal tensions of the grounding theory. Especially the following major problems can be identified. 
First, the legal hierarchy is a sequence of logical object and meta levels. Grounding theory normally takes the object level to be more fundamental than the meta level. For the pure theory, however, norms of a higher level are more fundamental than norms of a lower level. Besides, the grounding relation does not provide the conceptual apparatus to capture the feature that something which is only implicit on an object level can be made explicit on a meta level and to co capture the complex relationship between the levels. Second, the basic metaphysical relation of equiprim ordiality is characteristic for Neo-Kantianism. For Kant, the transcendental I and the objective world are equiprim ordial. For Kelsen, the basic norm and the legal system are equiprim ordial. This basic relation, meaning that its element condition each other and cannot be derived from anything else, seems to be incompatible with grounding theories monodirectional foundationalism. Third, as long as grounding theory assumes that is elements ground ought elements so that a direct inference from a natural fact to legal norm or legal fact is possible, it violates the is ought dualism. Supervenience seems to be better qualified to capture this relation. Fourth, the relation between grounding and inference or deduction is not clear. If it is a feature of grounding that it must be conceivable that the ground exists without the grounded element, then it needs external criteria in the form of general rules to decide under which conditions the grounding relation holds. In that case, it seems that the explanatory function is taken over by such general rules, um, transition rules, enabling conditions, bridging principles, as they are called in grounding literature, and that they serve as first premises in the deduction of the grounded element. If, on the other hand, it were not conceivable that the ground exists without the grounded element, grounding seems to dwindle into entailment. The necessity of external criteria which are given by pre-existing general rules also seems to follow from the simple fact that we have no special sense to detect a metaphysical grounding relation independent of such rules. Besides, it seems to be impossible that the ground fully determines the grounded element as long as there's some kind of surplus quality in the letter, as is regularly the case. And if there is some surplus quality, any inference from the ground to the grounded element without the assumption of some general law making possible is excluded. So it seems in the end that grounding is not a primitive notion. Rather, a grounding relation is constituted by the application of general laws and that it runs the risk, at least in the new Kantian context of Kaysen's theory, to fall prey to Occam's razor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Monika Salewska, Professor Karsten Heidman, for this uh, magnificent lecture which offers a new vision about Hans Kelsen and their relationship with uh, New Kantian uh, influence. Uh, we are going to continue with the next uh, lectures. And by the end, we will have a period of question and answers. A continuación, eh, transmitiremos la conferencia del profesor Daniel García López, quien es, eh, catedrático en la Universidad de Granada, me permito leer su semblanza curricular. Es licenciado y doctor en Derecho por la Universidad de Almería. Realizó su tesis doctoral sobre la relación entre la metáfora orgánica, el paradigma inmunitario y la pureza metodológica en el pensamiento jurídico alemán a lo largo del siglo XX. Actualmente es profesor de filosofía del Derecho en la Universidad de Granada ha hecho estancias de investigación en las universidades Autónoma de Madrid y von Humboldt de Berlín, así como en el Instituto Italiano de Ciencia Humana de Napoli y el Centro de Estudios Políticos y Constitucionales de España. Es autor de varios libros, artículos y capítulos de libro. Ha participado en la elaboración de leyes, proyectos de ley e informes para la Organización de las Naciones Unidas en el ámbito LGTBI. Su último libro, publicado en 2020, lleva por título La Máquina Teoantropolegal, la persona en la teoría jurídica franquista. Eh, la conferencia que transmitiremos del profesor Daniel García López se intitula 1921, 
el acontecimiento Weimar entre Hans Kelsen, Carl Schmidt y Walter Benjamin. Un, un momento, por favor. Buenas a, a todo el mundo y mis primeras palabras pues tienen que ser de, de disculpas por, por no poder estar en vivo con, con todos ustedes. Eh, pero en este grabo estas, estas, esta conferencia unos días antes porque el día 10, que es el día en el que se está emitiendo esta, este vídeo, estará al mismo tiempo en una, en una conferencia presencial en la, en la Universidad de Sevilla, en España, y no, no, no puedo estar, es complicado estar en los dos sitios. Pero bueno, eh, dicho esto, eh, pues mi, mi gratitud, mi gratitud, mis gracias a quienes han podido hacer este, este evento, a quienes han estado ahí organizándolo, y especialmente pues a, a, por, por la amistad y a mi amigo y colega eh, Fernando Carrillo de la UNAM, y, y muy feliz por poder compartir este, este espacio con, con, con amigos, especialmente. Con, con Alejandro González Monzón, de la Universidad de La Habana, en Cuba, eh, amigo ya desde, desde hace algunos años, y, y Javier Hernández, de, de la UNAM, así que muy feliz de, de poder compartir con ellos y también con, con compañeros de, de mi propio Departamento de Filosofía del Derecho de la Universidad de Granada, aquí en España, como, como José Joaquín Jiménez Sánchez y, y José Fadrolero Lero y Reza. Así que, como digo, pues agradecido, feliz y... Y también, pues, pidiendo eh, disculpas por no poder estar eh, presencial bueno, online en este mismo momento. Bien, eh, mi intervención va a girar en torno a tres autores, a la relación entre eh, Hans Kelsen, obviamente, protagonista del Congreso, junto a, a otro jurista, Carl Smith, que conocemos su enemistad, su polémica, pero también con un filósofo, Walter Benjamin. Eh, bien, en el año, eh, como saben, el 14 de junio de 1920, 1920 moriría en, en Múnich, moriría de neumonía en Max Weber. Y uno de sus legados fueron los Archives, la, la revista que fundó o que coeditó eh, durante hace unos años. Eh, y en ese mismo año en que muere Weber, eh, había, se había publicado en el número 47 el texto de Kelsen, Esencia y valor de la democracia. Y al año siguiente se publicaría en, en, los propios, en los propios archives, se publicarían eh, dos textos, un texto de Kelsen, otro texto de Kelsen en homenaje a, a Weber sobre el concepto de Estado desde la sociología y el texto de Benjamin, más importante en términos jurídicos, que es su texto para una crítica de la violencia. También en ese, en ese mismo año, 1900, 1921, se publicaría un, texto de, un libro de Smith eh, sobre la dictadura, la dictadura, eh, y bueno, seis años después, en las propias páginas de, de los archivos, publicaría su famoso texto, El concepto de lo político. Y bien, 1921 también es el año en el que pues, eh, Mussolini funda el partido fascista y, eh, y Hitler ocupa el, el, la dirección de, del Partido Nacional Socialista. Pues bien, 1920-1921, ¿qué relación hay entre eh, Weber, Kelsen, Benjamin Smith? Quizá la respuesta la encontremos en Kant, no se pueda encontrar en Kant y en, el, y en la defensa del fundamento de la libertad, de la legalidad, perdón, el fundamento de la legalidad, la defensa que hace del fundamento de la legalidad en el orden vigente en tanto vigente. Voy a leer un fragmento de la metafísica de las costumbres en el que eh, Kant eh, dice, dice lo siguiente. En, por tanto, un cambio en una constitución política defectuosa, que bien puede ser necesario a veces, solo puede ser introducido por el soberano mismo mediante reforma, pero no por el pueblo, por consiguiente, no por revolución. Por lo demás, si una, si una revolución ha triunfado y se establece una nueva constitución, la ilegitimidad del comienzo y de la realización no puede librar a los súbditos de la obligación de someterse como buenos ciudadanos al nuevo orden de cosas, y no pueden negarse a obedecer lealmente 
a la autoridad que tiene ahora el poder. Creo que este es el punto de unión entre lo que veremos de, 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 Hem, de Kelsen, eh, eh, de Benjamin y de, y de Schmidt. Pues bien, em, como decía, eh, hay tres textos de, eh, que se publicaron en 1920 eh, de Kelsen que creo que influyeron en, en Schmidt y en, y en Benjamin. Uno es la Constitución Austriaca de 1920, escrita por Kelsen. Otro es el problema de la soberanía, el texto de Kelsen en el que aboga por la eliminación de, este, de esta categoría y esencia y valor de la democracia. Con estos textos lo que hace Kelsen es romper ya definitivamente con su maestro Jelinek. Dirá, plantear a Kelsen como la soberanía, <coughs> perdón, será así planteada, ¿no? La planteará como una norma de carácter objetivo, omitiendo de esta forma la personificación, la voluntad y la decisión. La soberanía radicaría en el mismo derecho, por lo que el derecho se instituye como lo supremo e independiente que se impone sobre la voluntad. De esta forma es coherente tanto con lo que señalaba en 1911 en los problemas capitales, en los problem, como lo que dirá en 1934, unos años después, en la teoría pura del derecho. ¿no? Estado y derecho se identifican mutuamente, pero también se confunden como orden. Bien, a esta posición, eh, Hermann Heller denunciará el vaciamiento que hace Kelsen del derecho al situar a la soberanía en una ley ideal y obviando la realidad donde hay autoridad, desde donde es posible preguntarse quién decide qué. Por eso, el problema que señalará eh, Heller será el de la despersonalización de la soberanía, eh, a la que, por ejemplo, Kelsen sustituye la voluntad de decidir por el funcionamiento lógico-formal y ahistórico del orden jurídico. Por eso, Heller, para Heller, el problema de la soberanía es sociológico y no jurídico. Frente a la red de conceptos piramidales de Kelsen, Heller opondrá un poder, una voluntad situada en el pueblo. Pues bien, será en esencia y valor de la democracia cuando Kelsen plantee el instinto de libertad eh, con la necesidad del orden social. ¿no? En este momento trae Kelsen al que califica como el apóstol de la libertad, que será eh, Rousseau. Plantea cómo la democracia por unanimidad solo funcionaría en la creación del contrato social. En el resto funcionaría solo la democracia indirecta del principio de la mayoría. Pero este principio mayoritario no, está, no estaría justificado por la igualdad, sino por la libertad. ¿No? La democracia en Kelsen es configurada como mera forma, como dirá Pintore, una democracia sin derechos. La normatividad como sistema autoconcluido, de tal forma que el sistema funciona como si estuviese fundamentado. ¿No? El sistema se construye por medio de decisiones autorizadas por normas superiores. Es así que pueblo y Estado se reconcilian o se produce una neutralización, podríamos preguntar, ¿no? Porque ¿quién decide en último lugar? Lo que, lo que nos plantea Kelsen es una definición de comunidad del pueblo, ¿no? Como sistema de actos individuales, pero en negativo. Pues no es, un suje, no es sujeto, sino objetivo del poder entendido como una abstracción, lo que provoca que la comunidad carezca de palabra, le sea sustraída como la democracia carece de, de valor comunicativo. La democracia está así vacía de comunidad, podríamos decir, eh, con Roberto Espósito. ¿Qué herida revela la desubjetivación del sujeto soberano? ¿Dónde queda la violencia en, el concepto autofundativa, en la concepción autofundativa del derecho de Kelsen? Pues aquí la historia se repite y se replica. El debate en la filosofía del derecho moderna entre alternativas topológicas que sitúan, se sitúan en polos opuestos, política-derecho, poder-ley, decisión-norma, cuyo objetivo es la realización la relación entre soberano y súbdito. ¿no? Lo que encontramos en Kelsen es el uno, uno en el sentido jovesiano, el uno teológico-político necesario para la conservación del orden, la unidad que excluye toda dualidad, el dos, la dualidad de Spinoza. Y aquí el orden, orden y violencia pues, se coimplican. Muy bien, hasta aquí eh, las reflexiones de Kelsen sobre Kelsen. Y ahora quisiera plantearles la, eh, la gigantomaquia en torno a un vacío, ¿no? esa guerra de gigantes, de la que nos habla Giorgio Agamben en estado de excepción, que es el dossier esotérico, ¿no? podemos decir, esa relación encubierta o indirecta entre, entre Butler Benjamin y Carl Schmitt. Eh, la tensión entre ambos autores produjo, pues, como digo, un debate encubierto sobre la soberanía en la que se suele omitir la figura de Kelsen, de hecho, pues, en ese dossier esotérico del que plantea Giorgio Agamben, eh, excluye a Kelsen de, de la ecuación y creo que Kelsen tiene mucho o no tiene mucho que decir, o en el sentido de que Benjamin y Schmidt pues, responden, creo, indirectamente también a Kelsen. En, en cierta medida, la teoría de la soberanía de Schmidt fue una respuesta a la concepción de la violencia benjaminiana. ¿no? 
Eh, se trata de un dossier que va desde 1921, desde que la publicación de la crítica de la violencia de Benjamin y la dictadura de Smith, hasta que en el año 1973 eh, Smith confesara en una carta a, que su libro del año 38 sobre Hobbes pues, era una respuesta a Benjamin. Bien, ¿Qué pretende Benjamin en su texto del año 21? Pues pretende localizar una violencia por fuera del derecho, una violencia que escape a la dialéctica poder constituyente, poder constituido, una violencia que él llamará una traine que val, una violencia pura. Bien, en los seis libros de la República, eh, Bodin diferenciaba entre dos especies de ejercicio del poder estatal, ¿no? la ordinaria y la extraordinaria. En la ordinaria se trata de un funcionario ordinario como persona pública a la que se le confía una acción limitada por la ley. En, en la extraordinaria tenemos un comisario, también persona pública, a la que se le confía una acción extraordinaria limitada por la comisión. Por lo tanto, ambos cumplen una función pública, pero mientras que que uno está fundado en la, eh, en la ley, en un, es un cargo permanente y su actividad está prevista y limitada por la ley, el otro encuentra su fundamento en la orden, su cargo no es permanente, sino que depende de la actividad extraordinaria encomendada, que queda circunscrita a las instrucciones y, por tanto, finaliza una vez cumpla su, su, su cometido. A partir de esta distinción, Smith hablará de la dictadura soberana y de la dictadura comisarial como dos formas de, de, de modelo de ejercicio de poder extraordinario del que hablaba Bodán. Pues bien, la dictadura no deja de ser para Smith un concepto jurídico, pero mientras que la dictadura comisorial suspende la Constitución, que sigue siendo válida pero está suspendida, para protegerla de su existencia concreta, protegiéndolo de un ataque que la amenaza, la dictadura soberana no suspende la Constitución, sino que aspira a crear una situación que haga posible una Constitución a la que considera la Constitución verdadera, ¿no? Si la dictadura comisarial apela a una Constitución existente, la soberana lo hace a una Constitución por implantar. Sí. Es así que cobre sentido la distinción entre poder constituyente y poder constituido. La dictadura sí. comisarial si queda vinculada con el poder constituido, es autorizada por un órgano constituido y trae fundamento de la propia constitución que pretende que suspende para protegerla. En cambio, la dictadura soberana se define por el poder constituyente, capaz de fundar un nuevo orden jurídico. Lo que se pretende es no reducir el Estado a un mero artificio procedimental. Aquí, pues, aquí ya nos resuena Kelsen. Ante esta diferencia, que en última instancia eh, pretendía articular la justificación de una dictadura soberana que acabara con la República de Weimar, Benjamin va a responder. ¿no? Eh, y, en, y publicará en 1921, eh, publicaría esta, eh, hacia la crítica de la violencia. Eh, Benjamin comienza con una advertencia, ¿no? es la ambivalencia del concepto Gewalt. Gewalt en alemán significa tanto violencia como poder legítimo. Y es por eso que las traducciones que se han hecho al español, al inglés o al francés, se enfatiza eh, la, 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 el significado de violencia y se omite el significado de poder legítimo, que es, que es la ambigüedad con la que juega, con la que juega eh, Benjamin. Es decir, el poder legítimo es la otra cara de la violencia. La autoridad o la fuerza pública es la otra cara de la violencia. Eh, por eso, ¿cómo distinguir entre, preguntaría Jacques Derrida, ¿cómo distinguir entre la fuerza de ley de un poder legítimo y la violencia pretendidamente originaria que debió instaurar esta autoridad y que no pudo haber sido autorizada por una legitimidad anterior. Si bien dicha violencia no es, una, no, no, no es en ese momento inicial, ni legal ni ilegal, eh, o como otros o sea, persuadían a decir, dice Derrida, ni justa ni injusta. Pues bien, el método que plantea Benjamin es analizar la violencia en relación con el derecho y la justicia. Y para ello recurre a la distinción kantiana, aquí de nuevo tenemos a Kant, entre medios y fines, tanto el derecho natural como el derecho positivo, las dos grandes corrientes de pensamiento que nos explican qué es el derecho, pues se utilizan el mismo significado para la relación entre justicia, derecho y Gewalt. Se trata de la dialéctica medios-fines. ¿no? La concepción naturalista justifica medios violentos para fines justos. De esta forma el derecho no conoce la justicia, sino la justificación de los medios, que pueden ser o no violentos. ¿no? Un fin justo justifica los medios y su violencia. Del mismo modo, pero a la inversa, ocurre con el positivismo jurídico. Si aparentemente parece una corriente diametralmente opuesta al naturalismo, pues ambos mantienen un dogma fundamental. Se pueden alcanzar fines justos mediante medios legítimos y unos medios legítimos se pueden aplicar a fines justos. Si el derecho natural ¿no? eh, justifica los medios a través de la justicia de los fines, por ejemplo, el fin de la seguridad jurídica el fin de la, de la seguridad justifica la suspensión de derechos fundamentales, pues el derecho positivo garantiza la justicia de los fines a través de la legalidad de los medios. Por ejemplo, la mayoría puede decidir si el medio es conforme a derecho, eh, si el medio es conforme a derecho, la mayoría puede decidir situar en la excepción a la minoría. ¿no? Kelsen y Smith entran dentro 
y una dinámica de medios y fines. Eh, como digo, Kelsen y Schmidt. Así que Benjamin distinga, distingue dos tipos de violencia. La violencia instauradora y la violencia conservadora de derecho serían partícipes de esta dialéctica medios fines, o en terminología smithiana, poder constituyente o dictadura soberana y poder constituido o dictadura comisarial. Pareciera, por tanto, que la relación entre derecho y violencia no es instrumental, sino constitutiva. Todos los fines del derecho, como su, tanto los fines del derecho como su propio origen, remiten a la violencia. Lo que amenaza al derecho es la exterioridad, lo que queda afuera. Por eso la violencia es la única capaz de garantizar el derecho. ¿no? La violencia es lo originario del derecho, diríamos con Benjamin. Es lo que lo amenaza y lo que lo constituye. Por eso son tres los pasajes. Primero, en el comienzo encontramos un hecho violento, jurídicamente infundado, que funda el derecho. En segundo lugar, el derecho instituido excluye toda violencia externa a él mismo. Y en tercer lugar, eh, dicha exclusión solo es posible realizarla por medio de una violencia ulterior que ya no es instituyente, sino que es conservadora del poder establecido. Por eso nos dirá Roberto Espósito, el derecho consiste en esto, en una violencia a la violencia por el control de la violencia. ¿no? El derecho no quiere eliminar la violencia, sino solo lo externo. Lo que quiere es interiorizar la violencia externa, el afuera. De ahí que cuando el orden jurídico no puede controlar el conflicto, y Benjamin piensa en la huelga, en la huelga general, eh, cuando no puede controlar el conflicto es cuando el poder del Estado se pone en cuestión, des desmintiendo así la unidad de entre Estado y derecho pregonada por Kelsen. El derecho crea así otro mundo, una ficcio, y al mismo tiempo reduce el mundo a su ficcio. De ahí que no pueda haber igualdad sino fuerzas equivalentes. Por eso, ¿cómo responder a la pregunta por la violencia inmediata, eh, pura, que sea capaz de poder poner coto a esa violencia mítica, conservadora o fundadora de derecho? Aquí se localiza o localiza Benjamin otra violencia, otro tipo de fuerza ajena a la lógica instrumental de los medios y los fines que no pretende ni crear ni conservar derecho. Es lo que llama una traine que vale, ¿no? una violencia pura, divina o mesiánica. Por tanto, frente a la violencia mítica del derecho que encontramos en la pareja poder constituyente, poder constituido, dictadura comisarial, eh, dictadura soberana en Smith, eh, Benjamin opone una violencia divina, destructora dirá, e incruenta. Una violencia que no pretende el poder, sino la justicia. Así queda interrumpida la lógica mítica del derecho como obra humana. La violencia divina, esta violencia eh, pura, es letal pero incruenta. Porque la crítica de la violencia, eh, dirá Benjamin, no puede ser sino la crítica del derecho. La violencia pura reconfigura la relación entre derecho y justicia. La violencia pura no es un medio para un fin. Se trata de un medio puro al margen de los fines. No se trata de una violencia como medio justo o injusto para un fin determinado. Ya no es una violencia en tanto derecho que se instaura o se conserva, sino que es una violencia que deshace, deshace, ¿no? Y como apunta eh, Giorgio Agamben en, en Estado de Excepción, en, bueno, en una entrevista que le hacen a la edición argentina de Estado de Excepción, dice Benjamin, la ruptura del nexo entre violencia y derecho abre dos perspectivas a la imaginación. La imaginación es naturalmente una praxis. La primera es la de una acción humana sin ninguna relación con el derecho. La violencia revolucionaria de Benjamin o un uso de las cosas y de los cuerpos que no tenga nunca la forma de un derecho. La segunda es la de un derecho sin ninguna relación con la vida. El derecho no aplicado, sino solamente estudiado, el cual Benjamin decía que es la puerta de la justicia. Fin de la cita de esta entrevista a Giorgio Agamben. Por tanto, se trata de una violencia por fuera del derecho, una violencia exterior, que es lo que el derecho no puede tolerar. ¿Por qué el derecho entiende la violencia externa como un peligro que debe ser neutralizado? ¿La violencia es un peligro para los fines que persigue el derecho? Desde luego que no. Pues eh, dirá Benjamin eh, que en este caso no se condenaría la violencia como tal, sino solamente la aplicada a fines ilegales. ¿no? El derecho necesita monopolizar la violencia no por defender fines ju jurídicos, sino para salvaguardar el derecho como tal. Pues la violencia, si no se encuentra en manos del derecho, lo pone en peligro, no mediante los fines que persiga, sino ya por el hecho de su mera existencia externa al derecho. Eh, dirá Benjamin. Para neutralizar esta violencia externa al derecho, que ni lo crea ni lo conserva, Smith, un año más tarde y en respuesta silente, tratará de incluir la violencia pura en el orden jurídico. Apunta Agamben, el estado de excepción es el dispositivo mediante el cual Smith responde a la afirmación benjaminiana de una acción humana integralmente anómica. Es a partir de la figura del estado de excepción que, que Smith neutralizará esa violencia pura y anómica. La violencia pura es entonces capturada e incluida en el nomos. La violencia soberana del estado de excepción no suprime el derecho, sino que lo suspende. 
Por eso en, en teología política Smith ya no hablará de poder constituyente, poder constituido, sino que situará la decisión como el elemento fundamental de la soberanía, la decisión como fundamento último de validez. Eh, porque si bien es cierto que el soberano debe tener la capacidad de decidir, es condición de ello que excepción y regla no se confundan. Eh, más como dice Smith en teología política, si soberano es aquel eh, que decide sobre el estado de excepción, Benjamin mostrará un año, años más tarde, al final de su vida, que el estado de excepción en el que vivimos ha devenido la regla, dirá en su concepto de historia. Por tanto, excepción y regla se confunden y la decisión soberana es así imposible. Lo que aquí se quiere plantear, en definitiva, lo que quiero plantearles es la posibilidad de al menos tres modelos. Un modelo continental, un modelo oceánico y un modelo archi archipiélago. Los dos primeros modelos, el continental y oceánico, podemos encontrarlos en Kelsen y en Smith. El primero, el modelo continental, tiene su basamento histórico en el derecho romano y su constitución pasa por la teología política, el naturalismo y el racionalismo perfeccionado con el positivismo jurídico. En este modelo encontramos un soberano estatal como punto central de imputación de poder en régimen de monopolio. El modelo oceánico, por su parte, de raíz germánica, señala que la producción del derecho no recae en exclusiva sobre un Estado persona como autoridad central formalmente investida de poder, sino que procede de las autonomías y entrelazamientos entre distintas asociaciones con especial papel de la costumbre. Estos dos modelos, continental y oceánico, se dividen así eh, a Occidente, ¿no? se presentan como sus dos mitades, eh, civil law y eh, common law. Eh, la conclusión del primer modelo viene representada por Kelsen, en el, en el que prima la racionalidad centralista. Y Smith nos da claves del segundo, el modelo eh, oceánico. El, el multipolarismo, la potestad e indirectae, han de ser neutralizadas para Smith. El decisionismo de Smith se dirige en este sentido. ¿No? El soberano decide la neutralización, suspendiendo así el conflicto entre los distintos sujetos y creando un nuevo orden, ya no confesional, sino civil y político. La pregunta que dejo es si es posible pensar un tercer modelo en el que el derecho ya no esté vinculado al presupuesto de la adquisición espacial, principalmente de tierra. ¿Es posible un modelo archipiélago de interconexión sin apropiación de tierra alguna al modo de las constelaciones de Benjamin? Pues dejo esa pregunta quizás para un, para un trabajo futuro. Muchas gracias y disculpad por haber pasado un poco de tiempo. Thank you very much and we are going to continue with the exposition with the lecture of Professor uh, Matthews Pellegrino da Silva. Professor, can you hear me? Yes. I believe uh, you can see me too, right? Yes, quite clear. As I mentioned before, each participant has more or less 20 minutes to make the exposition. And uh, by the end, we have a period of questions and answers, but at, by the end of each presentation. Okay, I'll just uh, organize here. Uh, I believe now you can see the slides. Yes, quite clear. Thank you. Okay, so. Well, uh, thank you for the invitation. And um, today I want to speak about the pictorial representation and misrepresentation of the staircase-like construction, the Stufenbaum. Uh, legal theory is normally associated with words, not with figures. Uh, and one of the best known exceptions to this rule has to do with the so-called Kelsen's pyramid. This is a pictorial tool that is usually employed to teach about the hierarchical structure of the norms, to teach about the hierarchical relations that the different kinds of norm have with each other. But uh, Kelsen is actually neither the first to refer to the image of a picture, nor the author of the theory that should be explained, should be illustrated through this image of a tree, of a uh, pyramid. Actually, Merkel is the author of the theory of the hierarchical structure of the norms. Merkel is the author of the doctrine of the staircase-like construction, the Stufenbaum later. And I want today, today I want to present some of the problems that are related to the usual picture uh, to the picture that 
is usually employed when someone speaks about chaos and pyramid. And also I want to, through the criticism to this picture, I want to indicate the main characteristics of Merkel's theory of the hierarchical relations between the norms. And I want also to indicate how it would be possible to represent pictorially the staircase-like construction. Well, first of all, Kelsen employed indeed the word pyramid. Kelsen employed the word norm pyramid, pyramid of the norm. Uh, but before he has done so, Merkel had already employed this word. Merkel spoke about a pyramid. He also wrote that there would exist a hashed pyramid, a legal pyramid. But one point that's important to highlight here is that Merkel used the word, he asserted that the structure of the norms would look like a pyramid. Merkel is not the author of the commonly used norm, commonly used picture, the commonly used image of a triangle that's cut by some horizontal lines. And then in each of the levels of, of this triangle, we find the names of kinds of norms, like judicial decision, decrees, laws, constitution, basic norm. There are variations of this image, but uh, we can find many, uh, we can find this practically the same image in many languages, in many um, materials about legal theory. Well, uh, regarding this traditional uh, image, traditional representation of the hierarchical structure, there are three criticisms that can be made. Before we indicate how the staircase-like construction of the legal order could be pictorially represented. A first criticism regards the position of the judicial decisions in this pyramid. Practically always the judicial decisions will be at the very end of the pyramid, in this case, triangle. Um, but this is not, does not correspond to how things happen in real world, how the legal orders deal with the position of the judicial decisions. Uh, why is that? Why can that be a misrepresentation? Well, uh, we have a situation in which we are discussing if a law is unconstitutional or not. And then, and then a constitutional court declares that the law is unconstitutional. We have then a judicial decision, a individual norm, a decision of the constitutional court that declares that the law is unconstitutional. So in this situation, I have in the hierarchy, I have constitutional norms and then directly after that, I have a judicial decision. I can also have a judicial decision that is based on constitutional norms and norms that are included in laws, but only that. The judicial decisions can be in different places, in different levels of the construction. They will be in the le last level, but the last level may be the next one, just after the level of the constitutional norms. Uh, in order to clarify a little more this situation, we need to deal with why we are, the question about why we are presenting the norms, the kinds of norms in a hierarchical way. Why we are doing that? And to understand that, we need first to understand what Merkel means with the expression, with the idea that law has a double face, doppel and uh, Merkel asserts that the law has a double face, that the norms have a double face, and he says, he describes the fact that law, I quote Merkel, law exhibits necessarily two steps, one step of absolute law creation and one step of absolute law application, between which many arbitrarily decided steps from manifestations could appear, which can be presented both as law creation and also as law application. That means if I have a law, for instance, I have a kind of norm, that exists that can be observed both as law creation, the creation of a new norm, the, no, the law that was created. I can also observe this law 
as law application, the application of the constitutional norms that empower a certain authority to create that law. When we are seeing the norms in this, through this prism, when we are observing the norms as the product of the application of another norm, what we are doing is we are dealing with the justification for the validity of a norm. A law is a valid law. A law is a valid norm thanks to the application of a constitutional norm. A decree is a valid decree thanks to the application of the norms that are included in a law and the norms that are included in the constitution. The norms, they owe they thank their validity to different kinds of norms. A norm of one level will thank its validity to norms of the other levels. A decree will thank its validity to laws and to constitutional norms. A law will thank its validity to constitutional norms. That's why we are making one ranking between the norms. Regarding judicial decisions, we have situations in which a judicial decision is valid thanks only to the application of norms of the constitution. That means I don't need to follow norms of laws to, uh, to create a judicial decision that's a valid judicial decision. I can have a decision of a constitutional court that declares a law unconstitutional. This decision is valid, is valid thanks to the application of a norm of the constitution. And that's what is necessary in this case in the case of this kind of judicial decision. So different kinds of judicial decisions require the fulfillment, the fulfillment of different conditions. So it's not adequate, it's not appropriate to describe individual norms, to present them as depending for its validity from all other kinds of norms. That's not necessarily what will happen in reality in a concrete legal order. A second step, a second, I'm sorry, a second, a second problem regarding this uh, usual presentation, representation of the staircase-like construction. A second, second problem has to do with the fact that normally in this representation, we find one kind of norm in each step. We don't find two or three kinds of norm in the same step of the staircase-like construction. That is also problematic because the criterion to assert that this norm belongs to this step of the staircase-like construction, the criteria is the conditions for the validity. So we have norms that belong to a certain step of the staircase-like construction because they take their validity to laws, for instance. Let's say we are dealing with decrees and decrees takes their validity to laws. They are in a different step in comparison with the step in which the laws are. But we can also have two kinds of norm in the same step of the staircase-like construction. This happens, for instance, in the Brazilian legal order. In Brazilian legal order, we have two kinds of law. Both kinds of law are created based on constitutional norms. They only need to fulfill the conditions that are established in the constitutional norms in order to be valid norms. So, it's possible to think of a staircase-like construction in which one step is not occupied by only one kind of norm, but by, by two or more than two kinds of norm. Well, a third problem with the usual representation of the staircase-like construction involves the fact that when we are speaking about hierarchical relations between the norms, we may need to speak about more than one hierarchization of the norms. And we, need, we may need to speak about more than one staircase-like construction. We may need more than one staircase-like construction to represent the hierarchical relations that the norms have in a concrete legal order. Why is that so? We are speaking about a hierarchization. When we are speaking about a hierarchization, what is our starting point? Our starting point is the fact that we need a standard to make that hierarchization. 
a standard to rank the elements of a ranking. One standard for a hierarchization of the norms is the standard of the conditions for the valid creation of a kind of norm. So I will put different norms in different levels of the staircase-like construction because some norms, some kinds of norm require the fulfillment of more conditions than other kinds of norms. So a decree, if a decree needs to fulfill the conditions of laws and the constitution, and the laws need only to fulfill the conditions of the constitution, that's the reason why I will put these two kinds of norms in different levels of the staircase-like construction. This is one standard, the conditions to validly, validly create a kind of norm. But we can also rank the norms according to another kind of condition. We can rank the norms considering another function that a norm exercises. One of the functions of the norm, of a norm, is to justify the validity of a norm that was created through the application of this norm. One of the functions of a law is to justify the validity of the decrees. But I can also classify the norms considering another function that the norms have. The norms have also the function of derogating other norms. So norms not only will be used to create other norms, norms can also be used to derogate other norms. This is also a function of the norms. Not all kinds of norm have the same derogatory power. Different kinds of norm have different kinds of derogatory power. A simple example, laws cannot derogate constitutional norms. Constitutional norms can derogate laws. So they have different derogatory powers. That's the reason why I will rank these two kinds of norm differently. So this is the reason why uh, to present the hierarchical relations of the norms with just one staircase-like construction is also problematic. Now, what I want to do is first to indicate how uh, it would be possible uh, to my understanding to represent pictorially the staircase-like construction of the legal order. First, I want to deal with the staircase-like construction according to the, con to the relations of conditionality. That means according to the relations regarding the conditions for the valid creation of a kind of norm. Uh, this is um, a picture of a segment of the whole legal order. What I'm presenting here are some individual norms. For instance, individual norm one, this is a norm that is valid and thanks its validity directly to a constitutional norm. So if I have, for instance, as I said before, a judicial decision, a decision of a constitutional court that declares a law unconstitutional, I have an individual norm, a judicial decision that is valid and thanks its validity just to the application of a constitutional norm, laws double face, applying a norm, and creating an norm. This constitutional court is applying a constitution, constitutional norm and creating a norm, a individual norm, a sentence. Another situation, a individual norm, a sentence in a judicial case that applies not only a constitutional norm that made possible the creation of a tax law, but also applies a norm that is in a tax law. So in this case, this kind of individual norm needs to follow two conditions, needs to, fo needs to follow the conditions established by the constitutional norm and also by a norm that is in a tax law. The same thing goes for the individual norm three, for instance. Another kind of norm that for its valid creation needs to follow the norms that are in a decree, in a general tax norm, and also in the constitution. So the staircase-like construction according to the relations of conditionality is actually a set of buildings or a building that shares a first level, the level of the constitutional norms, but after that, it can reach different heights. 
you can have a different number of levels from that on. And this depends from the requirements for the creation of specific kinds of individual norms. That's pretty much just the indication of the individual norms. And now I want to speak a little more about the other uh, staircase-like construction, the staircase-like construction according to the derogatory power of the norms. As I said before, we can also rank the norms by considering their derogatory power. I can observe norms and ask about the hierarchical position of a norm regarding another kind of norm by taking as a standard the derogatory power of the norms. Here I present in these two figures, two uh, hypothetical scenarios. So the first scenario is a scenario in which we have different derogatory powers for the different kinds of norms. In this case, one kind of norm, for instance, laws can derogate decrees and decrees cannot derogate laws. This is one specific situation. I can have in a concrete legal order that kind of situation. I can also have in a concrete legal order a situation in which two or more kinds of norms can, do, can derogate each other. That also depends from the specific configuration of a concrete legal order. So basically, and concluding now, what are my main conclusions with uh, these considerations? First of all, uh, to deal with a hierarchization, we need first to have something clear. The fact that if we are making a hierarchization, we need a standard for the hierarchization. If we are making a ranking, we need some kind of standard to rank the elements of that ranking. Regarding legal orders, we can rank the same norms by following, by having different, kind of different kinds of standards of criteria to make that ranking. So if we have the possibility, if in a legal order, we have norms that exercise different functions, ground the validity of other norms, but also derogate other norms, this is the reason why I need to present also that if I want to, sorry, if I want to present the hierarchical relations pictorially, I need also to consider that aspect of the legal norms, the fact that they exercise different functions. That would be that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Matthews Pellegrino for this interesting uh, exposition about a topic that is considered sometimes uh, finished in the theory of Hans Kelsen. I would like to offer to you my apologies because I forgot to present you with the audience. So I'm going to do that in this moment in Spanish and English, and then we are to continue with the next presentation. My apologies again. El profesor Matthews Pellegrino da Silva Estudió Derecho en la Pontificia Universidad Católica do Río Grande do Sul. Es licenciado en Filosofía por la Universidad Federal do Río Grande do Sul en Puerto Alegre. En 2015 obtuvo un doctorado en Filosofía por la Universidad do, do Vale do Río do Sinos en Sao Leopoldo con una disertación sobre la teoría de la democracia de Hans Kelsen. En 2019 obtuvo un segundo doctorado en Derecho por la Universidad de Friburgo con el trabajo La teoría cognitiva del derecho de Kelsen, simultáneamente una crítica reflexiva sobre la positi positividad como una propiedad del derecho. Professor Matthews Pellegrino da Silva studied law at the Faculty of Law of Pontificia Universidad Católica do Rio Grande do Sul and Philosophy at the Universidad Federal do Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Alegre. He obtained in 2015 a doctorate in philosophy from Universidad do Vale do Rio dos Sinos in Sao Leopoldo with a dissertation on Kelsen's theory of democracy. And he obtained also in 2019 
a doctorate in law from Freiburg, Freiburg University with the work Kelsen's Theory of Legal Cognition, Simultaneously a Critical Reflection on Positivity as Property Law. Thank you, Professor. And we are going to finish with the next uh, exposition by Professor Jorge Eduardo Carrillo Velázquez. Buenas, buenas tardes, Profesor Jorge Eduardo. Bienvenido, muchas gracias. Lo presento con nuestro auditorio. El profesor Eduardo Carrillo Velázquez es doctor, maestro y licenciado en Derecho por la Facultad de Estudios Superiores Aragón de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. Ha sido profesor en diversas universidades, entre ellas la Universidad del Distrito Federal, Universidad Insurgentes, Universidad Tecnológica Latinoamericana, Universidad Tecnológica de México y la FES Aragón, en las que ha impartido asignaturas como Derecho Constitucional, Juicio de Amparo, Argumentación Jurídica, Metodología Jurídica, Juicio de Amparo en Materia Penal y Derechos Humanos, entre otras. Es autor de diversos artículos en revistas especializadas y reconocidas. También es autor del libro Nuevo Proceso del Trabajo, Teoría y Práctica. Actualmente es catedrático de carrera de la Universidad del Valle de México, Campus San Rafael. Buenas tardes, profesor. Bienvenido. Pero no lo veo conectado. Eh, hace rato estaba, no, no sé, seguramente tuvo un, un percance con su conexión. Si me permites un segundo, le marco. Sí, por favor. Eh, les pedimos un, un poco de paciencia a todos nuestros eh, espectadores y espectadoras. Como, como pueden ver, ha sido una jornada bastante intensa en donde hemos eh, podido abrevar de diferentes perspectivas sobre Hans Kelsen desde una perspectiva histórica, eh, ofrecida por la profesora Sara Lagi, pasando por una reconstrucción neocantiana del profesor Karsten Heidmann y Mónica Zalewska, y, y bueno, también una perspectiva fresca sobre los debates entre Walter Benjamin y eh, Hans Kelsen, Carl Schmidt, y también no, no se queda atrás el profesor Matthews Pellegrino da Silva, quien nos ofrece una visión novedosa de lo que se considera quizá en algunas ocasiones un área agotada en el pensamiento que el señano como es la Stufenbaulera, la construcción escalonada del derecho y bueno, ha sido ¿Qué todo tal? un éxito. ¿Qué tal? ¿Sí? ¿Qué tal? Muy buenas tardes. Eh, sí, sí me encontraba conectado únicamente un pequeño problema al intentar abrir el audio, no se me permitía. Agradezco mucho concretamente al maestro Javier Hernández por la invitación que me hace a este foro. Eh, también agradezco enormemente al maestro Augusto Fernando Carrillo, a todos los que se encuentran aquí reunidos en estas disertaciones, de verdad, es maravilloso compartir ideas en estos momentos y que me permitan ingresar, por lo menos virtualmente, a sus centros de trabajo, sus hogares o incluso sus escuelas. Pues bien, mi tema, mi disertación será sobre cuál es la influencia de la filosofía clásica respecto de la obra o de las ideas principales de Hans Kelsen. En principio, deseo partir con un ejemplo sumamente burdo. Y es el hablar de una cuchara, de una simple cuchara. Cuando nosotros nos preguntemos qué es una cuchara, hemos de acudir al diccionario. Y efectivamente el diccionario, por lo menos en español, nos indica que es el utensilio que se compone de una parte cóncava prolongada en un mango y que sirve especialmente para llevar a la boca cosas líquidas, blandas o menudas. Si nosotros utilizáramos la metodología kelseniana, diríamos, esa definición es incorrecta. ¿Por qué? Porque para definir exactamente lo que es una cuchara, 
necesitamos despojarla de cualquier otro elemento que pudiera tener algún otro objeto para dejar únicamente lo que es una cuchara. ¿Qué quedaría? Bueno, cuando nosotros decimos utensilio, pues es una característica general que muchos objetos pueden tener. Por lo tanto, no nos sirve. Tenemos que quitar de la definición de cuchara lo que es utensilio. Cuando nosotros decimos que la cuchara sirve para llevar a la boca cosas líquidas, blandas o menudas, en efecto diremos que esa es la finalidad de la cuchara, no la cuchara en sí misma. ¿Qué nos queda? Bueno, que es un objeto con una parte cóncava prolongada en un mango. De ahí que si nosotros quisiéramos fabricar una cuchara de papel, sería una cuchara efectivamente con una parte cóncava y un mango. Empero, ¿eso nos serviría como cuchara? La respuesta evidente es no. ¿Por qué razón? Porque el objeto debe de estar asociado total y absolutamente a su finalidad. Pasa lo mismo con el derecho. Hans Kelsen intentó dejar libre lo que son los elementos puros y constitutivos del derecho y lo despojó de sus características, de sus finalidades y lo ha dejado como un objeto hueco que es fácil de adaptar a cualquier necesidad sin que sea necesario que cumpla sus fines. Kelsen, precisamente en teoría pura del derecho, por lo menos lo que dice la traducción en español, establece que una de las críticas que se han formulado a partir de la teoría pura del derecho es que en los países democráticos se ha visto como una especie de avanzada del fascismo. En los países liberales o de corte liberal se le ha visto indicios de bolchevismo y además en los países capitalistas, perdón, en los países bolchevistas se le ha visto como una avanzada de lo que es el capitalismo. Y lejos de que ello fuera en realidad una crítica, en palabras de Kelsen, eso manifiesta su pureza. ¿Qué nos ha dicho? Bueno, el derecho en realidad no podemos separarlo de lo que es. El derecho es un continente. El derecho contiene algo. El derecho es un instrumento. Sin embargo, ¿cuál es el contenido de ese instrumento? Y eso es lo que deja de lado la visión de Kelsen. Kelsen también reconoce, una cosa es la teoría política y otra cosa es el derecho, la axiología e infinidad de ciencias, la sociología. Pero no le resta valor a la influencia que pueden tener todas esas ciencias al contenido del derecho. La misión de Kelsen es simplemente definir qué es el derecho en su forma más pura. Y un poco jugando con la idea de, de Francis Bacon con Aristóteles, el problema no es la metodología de Kelsen, no es la definición de Kelsen. El problema que se ha producido es de los autores que han partido de Kelsen para fundamentar aberraciones. Y aquí, al hablar de aberraciones, me llama la atención porque curiosamente la teoría kelseniana en su forma pura ha sido muy popular en los países donde precisamente no ha habido regímenes democráticos, donde ha tenido una gran difusión la legalidad en aquellos lugares o latitudes donde precisamente se carece de la aplicación de legalidad, como lo es México. Y México tiene una historia de amor-odio con las posturas kelsenianas, no con Kelsen, insisto. Kelsen cumple muy bien su función. El problema son los aplicadores e intérpretes de Kelsen. El derecho debe de contener valores. El derecho debe de contener fines. 
y lo que lo distinguirá es la coactividad. De ahí que podemos decir que es la prima hermana de la ética. ¿En qué se distingue la ética del derecho? Bueno, ambas son ciencias concretamente racionales, son ciencias normativas, pero desde una visión muy amplia del derecho, no que el señana, claro. Es que el derecho es eminentemente coactivo, lo que nosotros hemos escuchado aquí con el carácter de violencia. Pero tampoco podemos hablar de violencia a la ligera, ni podemos dejar el hecho de que las palabras tienen múltiples interpretaciones. Y no quiero entrar en el juego de esas palabras. He dicho que Kelsen utiliza un... Me bueno, las consecuencias de la aplicación de Kelsen han generado consecuencias aberrantes. Pero el mismo método, la misma metodología de Kelsen es aberrante por sí misma. Por dos sencillas razones o dos cuestiones principales. Aquí hemos reconocido y los autores han mencionado que tiene una gran influencia Manuel Kant. Y efectivamente. Tanto así que la metodología que utiliza Kant en crítica de la razón pura y crítica de la razón práctica la trata de asimilar Kelsen a la utilización o a la obtención de lo que es una teoría pura del derecho. Es la obtención de imperativos categóricos. Específicamente en la fundamentación metafísica de las costumbres de Manuel Kant, Kant se pregunta, ¿cuáles son aquellos postulados que son válidos en todo momento, sin importar razones de tiempo, lugares, obviamente épocas o alguna otra circunstancia? A aquello que sea válido en todo momento, Kant le llamará imperativo categórico. Y son dos principalmente que se pueden eh, resumir en utiliza o más bien observa a las personas como fines y no hagas a otros lo que no deseas recibir. Bueno, se pueden interpretar, pero ese es una, un extracto ¿no? de lo que Kant nos dice. El problema es que Kelsen, al utilizar esta metodología, da el carácter de imperativo categórico a la norma jurídica, siendo que la norma jurídica no necesariamente debe de tener un contenido ético desde la visión que el señala. Ok, ese es el primer punto. La contradicción, que yo llamo aberrante, es que Kelsen también es un positivista. ¿Cómo es posible conciliar una visión idealista como es la kantiana con una visión positivista o materialista como es el positivismo, como es la influencia que Weber ejerce sobre él y que a su vez es ejercida por Augusto Comte. Y aquí vemos Comte en esta visión que, de principios de filosofía positiva. Dice, utilizó la filosofía, el término filosofía, no como sentido de ciencia, sino para transmitir el contenido de una idea. Pero cuando nosotros realizamos, en la, de acuerdo, siguiendo a Comte, este carácter estructural de lo que es la ciencia, mientras más especializada es la ciencia, resulta más perfecta. Esa es la gran idea que toma Kelsen para fundar la teoría pura del derecho. Es decir, Kant desprecia eh, perdón, eh, Kant desprecia a la filosofía porque es la más genérica de todas las ciencias. Como por, eh, por ejemplo, toma las matemáticas y dice que son más generales que la física. Por lo tanto, la física es más perfecta que las matemáticas. Kelsen toma esta idea y dice, busquemos aquello que es específicamente y concretamente el derecho, para que sea una ciencia en el sentido positivo, demostrar que es de carácter especializado en la visión positiva. Pero la aplicación 
de esa normatividad es del todo idealista al utilizarla como imperativo categórico. ¿Por qué razón? Porque el derecho no tiene movilidad por sí misma, movilidad intelectual. El derecho necesita ser creado y necesita ser aplicado. ¿Cuál es ese imperativo entonces? Bueno, se verá manifestado en una deducción. Y es en una deducción específicamente de carácter aristotélico, donde la norma será la premisa mayor, el caso concreto que el juzgador o el legislador desea resolver y la conclusión pues es la norma, ya sea individualizada o la norma general que será la ley. Ahora, ¿por qué he señalado que hay una serie de problemáticas si nosotros no, eh, no analizamos integralmente la obra de Kelsen? Bueno, Ah, podemos decir que hay dos tipos de Kelsen. El que funda la teoría pura del derecho, el que crea la idea del tribunal constitucional y tal vez un tercer Kelsen. Obviamente con una continuidad de pensamiento, pero vamos a encontrar un ter tercer Kelsen. En el ensayo que él elabora, que es, que se pregunta, ¿qué es la justicia? En teoría pura del derecho, la justicia es simplemente la aplicación de la norma jurídica, no hay más. Es más, la justicia no es un concepto jurídico, es un concepto de la ética. Bajo esta idea, pues, dentro de la existencia del Tribunal Constitucional, pues, el imperativo categórico será la norma constitucional y el órgano especializado será el Tribunal Constitucional. No, no hay mucho problema. Cuando vemos a un Kelsen ya en sus últimos momentos preguntándose qué es la justicia, hace un análisis del de estado del arte donde se verifican varias definiciones desde la época eh, socrática hasta los tiempos de, de su existencia sobre qué es la justicia y él concluye que es aquel... Eh, aquel espacio en que se logra el desarrollo de la ciencia y dice y reconoce además que existe un sistema jurídico previo al positivo nada más de que lo encuentra en el derecho internacional y lo refiere como aquello que los, que los naturalistas llaman el derecho natural nos deja ver que el pensamiento de Kelsen atraviesa o estaba atravesando una transformación donde veía la necesidad de que el derecho en su visión pura necesitaba incorporar el contenido de valores. Respecto del segundo Kelsen, la pregunta es, ¿qué es una constitución? Bueno, la Sal Ferdinand nos lo explicó, pero podemos decir que la constitución, independientemente de su forma, debe ser aquello que está compuesto de los valores, ideales, principios que fundarán un pueblo. Ahora, esta idea de constitución no es nueva, tampoco lo es la idea propiamente de Kelsen, de que la norma tiene que aplicarse por un órgano concreto, legitimado, eso siempre ha existido, y Kelsen lo reconoce. Sin embargo, Aquí el fundamento, aquí la crítica radicará desde la obra de Platón, concretamente en las leyes. ¿Cuál es la necesidad de que exista la ciudad y de que existan las leyes? Y bajo esta idea, Platón nos ha de decir que es, además de la existencia de la virtud, también nos dirá que es la paz y la inteligencia. En otro sentido, también podemos decir que la ley y el Estado existen para garantizar nuestra supervivencia.
como seres humanos. Si eso no es visible desde ninguna perspectiva jurídica, entonces carece de fondo, carece de raíz. En la visión que él señala no está esa visión, no está el objetivo del derecho. ¿Cuál es la problemática? Que cualquier régimen autoritario puede ser amparado en la visión kelseniana. Y yo les pongo el ejemplo más extremo, por no decir el más nefasto que nos ha ocurrido en la historia humana. Las leyes de Nuremberg expedidas en Alemania durante el periodo nazi eran válidas eran desde el punto de vista que el señano derecho efectivamente y duele reconocerlo las leyes nazis eran válidas eran derecho Empero, si las leyes son, eh, nazis eran válidas y las autoridades nazis actuaban bajo el amparo de la ley, ¿por qué fueron juzgados en los tribunales de Nuremberg? Y esa es una gran interrogante. Los nazis obviamente dijeron que es por el derecho del más fuerte, de que ellos habían sido los perdedores y estaban expuestos a un teatro donde simplemente se requería de legitimidad para ejecutarlos. Desde la visión de los aliados, era simple. Por mucha ley que exista, el ser humano no puede separar lo que es la justicia de lo que es la injusticia. No sé qué sea la justicia, yo digo que es indefinible, ojo, indefinible, que no quiere decir que no, se, que no podamos conocer intelectualmente qué es la justicia. Pero las normas deben de cumplir con un objetivo que es la justicia. Y eso rompe totalmente todos los siglos de filosofía que se habían inspirado desde la obra platónica hasta el advenimiento de la filosofía positiva. La obra de Kelsen por sí misma es perfecta. Hay un desequilibrio metodológico, sí. Kelsen lo sabe reconciliar. Pero los países que hemos enfrentado dictaduras, como el caso de México, que incluso han sido dictaduras constitucionales porque las normas se encuentran veladas bajo los intereses de grupo, nos damos cuenta que resultan inútiles. ¿Por qué? Porque el Estado, si bien ha producido normas válidas, no ha podido cumplir con su objetivo que es protegernos. Con ello, deseo concluir mi, mi intervención. Creo que ya desde hace algunos minutos me estaban señalando que el tiempo se me agotaba. Y deseo dejar esta última reflexión. Requerimos siempre, no importa de si estamos hablando de la validez de la norma, vamos a requerir de legitimidad. El concepto de constitución lo vamos a encontrar desde el mundo griego. Nada más que los griegos eh, establecieron un origen mítico y la validez de la ley se, de, se remontaba a seres semimitológicos como Minos o Radamanto como lo establece el propio Platón o como lo establecerá los alumnos de Aristóteles en la Constitución Ateniense. Cuando nosotros busquemos legitimidad en nuestra Constitución, vamos a encontrar el artículo 136, en que no importa lo que haya acontecido, si se interrumpe la observancia constitucional, cuando el pueblo recobre la libertad, se, continuera, se continuará con la observancia constitucional. Y si leemos el artículo 28 constitucional, 
27, perdón, 27 constitucional, observaremos o nos daremos la idea de que concretamente en México el periodo porfirías, porfiri, porfirista, la dictadura de Porfirio Díaz, fue una interrupción al régimen constitucional que venía desde 1857. Con ello concluyo estableciendo que necesariamente el derecho debe de ser un instrumento, cosa que se ha olvidado o que no fue tomada en la filosofía que el señala. Agradezco muchísimo su atención y cedo el uso de la palabra. Muchas, muchas gracias, profesor, por su magnífica presentación que pone sobre la mesa muchas interrogantes de Kelsen y su recepción en países como, como el nuestro. A continuación, pasaré a la sesión de preguntas y respuestas. Thank you very much for the participation of everyone today. If I may, I would like to start with Professor Matthews Pellegrino da Silva, uh, because he informed to me that he has a personal situation that it's impossible to avoid. And then I would like to uh, continue in order with Professor Sara Laji, uh, Karsten Heidman, and Professor Jorge Carrillo. Uh, there's a question uh, for Professor Matthews Pellegrino da Silva. Um, do you consider that this new version of new interpretation of Stufenbau Lera give us the possibility to comprehend Kelsen's theory under the new models of legal theory, such as Robert Alexis. Uh, there's a, a question to Professor Sarah Laji. Uh, what other models about uh, constitutional justice of Kelsen does exist and how they uh, has a coexistence with your proposal? There's a question to Professor Monica Salevska and Professor Karsten Heidman, formulated by Professor Carlos Rodriguez Manzanera. What do you think about the bridge between is and ought to in Kelsen's, uh, in Kelsen's Hume and Kant theory? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, as I mentioned, if, if I may, We can start with Professor Matius Pellegrino da Silva, then with Professor Sara Laghi, and so on. Well, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, regarding Alexi, well, I don't think that uh, this, what I presented here, I don't think that there is a lot of relations between Alexi and what I said today. Uh, at least uh, if we are speaking about the uh, Uh, Alexis' theory of the principles. Uh, I don't think that Merkel's uh, theory of the sterile case like construction has something to say specifically about principles. Actually, as far as I know, Merkel never wrote anything about that or, and he never uh, deal with the distinction between uh, rules and principles or something uh, of that matter. And I don't know if this is the direction of the question, but uh, if it is the direction of the question, I don't think that uh, we can find something in Merkel uh, about that. Uh, I don't think that, uh, but I also think that this is not, this was not uh, really the subject here. Uh, and well, could we put also, could we also include principles in a hierarchy and uh, We could, could we do something like uh, a structure in which principles uh, have derogatory power, a higher derogatory power than rules, but not the other way around? Yes, that would be possible. I, I, I need to, uh, I would need to think a little more about that. But I think that in principle we can use some of Merkel's, uh, some of Alex's ideas. We can put that in Merkel system regarding the derogatory power of the norms. Uh, but uh, that would be much more a new construction because in Merkel, we cannot find something that gives a direct answer to this question. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Professor Saralaji. Yes, I beg your pardon. Uh, could you please repeat the question because I'm not sure I understood it correctly. 
Thank you. Yes, Professor. Uh, what other models, uh, theoretical models, about Kelsen's constitution, constitutional justice does exist and how they are related with your proposal? As I understand, how? sorry, as I understand, the, the question is in the sense that probably there's another proposal uh, besides your yours. And uh, if exists a relationship between both? Uh, yes, that, that, that's a big question. That's a very, <clears throat> and that's a question for a legal theorist rather than for me. <laughs> but I will try to give you um, uh, an answer. What I wanted to uh, focus on my speech was try to explain the roots the historical roots of his model of constitutional uh, of his constitutional justice, uh, and his model of constitutional justice has been criticized by many legal theorists who uh, blame Skelzen for not uh, theorizing, for not formulating a coherent theory of uh, constitutional democracy, just because uh, his constitutional uh, court is made up of judges who uh, have to be the guardian of the constitution which does not include a stronger principles and strong values. So what I can tell you is the fact that from an historical point of view, his theory of the Verfassungsgerichtsbarkeit is absolutely a turning point in the history of the legal political uh, uh, thought. Because uh, before Kelsen only Carré de Malberg, the French legal theorist of the late uh, 19th century tried to propose something similar to a constitutional court. And before Carré de Malberg, there was Georg Jelinek. So Kelsen's uh, uh, theory of constitutional justice makes history in many different respects. But from a theoretical and political point of view, he is not able to provide us with a strong theory of constitutional democracy. What do I mean? I mean that in my opinion, and not only in my opinion, the biggest political problem with his theory of constitutional justice is that uh, he proposes to defend the constitution, but his proposal of defending constitution, his idea of how to defend constitution is relatively weak just because his idea of constitution does not include the presence of strong principles and strong values. In, uh, <clears throat> in other words, his theory of constitutional justice makes a history. He theorizes the, the existence of a constitutional court, but at the same time, in my opinion, he remains uh, convinced uh, that the core of political life is the legislative body. And since it's the legislative body, the core of political life, he disagrees with the idea to insert strong values and strong principles in the, in, in the constitutional text, because those principles and those values, in his opinion, have to take shape within the legislative body. And so the, the interesting, in terms of models of the constitutional justice theory, in my opinion, and this is uh, the conclusion of my attempt of, uh, of a response. In my opinion, his theory of constitutional justice from a political point of view is uh, on a limit, uh, is on the border between a political theory, which is uh, still very close to the primacy of legislative body and a political theory, which tries to uh, propose a way of uh, constraining the legislative body just to protect the minority. I, I hope uh, I was clear. Yes, Professor, that was very clear. And in my personal opinion, has a lot of sense when we consider, for example, your book or your thesis degree. And that's why probably Kelsen doesn't focus in, in the in values in constitutional uh, courts. Uh, for example, yesterday we, we heard that probably the relativism of Hans Kelsen could address to any kind of government. But, but as you mentioned, it's not possible because we have here a, an important institution, which is uh, parliament, parliamentarism, and Verfassungsgerichtshof, uh, as you mentioned before. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Professor. That, that, it was a pleasure to talk with you and to learn from you about an interesting topic, which is Hans Kelsen and his thought. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Karsten Heidman, can you hear me? Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes, quite clear. Thank you very much for your lecture. And as I know, Monica Salewska has to go out because it had yes, a compromise. Yes, mm -hmm. But it was uh, magnificent, that, that exposition. There's a question uh, to you, formulated by Professor Carlos Rodriguez Manzanera, and is, what do you consider about the bridge between East and Octu, uh, since the point of view of Kelsen, Hume, and Kant? Um, yes. Well, that's a very general question, and I try to to answer it as as exactly as possible. Well, Kelsen um, always um, well was of the opinion that there's a dualism between is and ought, so that no ought can be derived from an is, no is can be derived from an ought. In the 30s, he um, pointed to Hume as the author of the thesis of this dualism, but before and afterwards, he pointed to Kant as the author of this dualism, and he started uh, with Kant when explaining this dualism. And this makes it different, actually, because Hume didn't think that ought sentences were objective. So, um, it was just not a matter of taste, but, but they were not verifiable, um, all sentences according to Hume. And Kelsen thought so as well in a short period in the 30s. While he was in his Neo-Kantian phase in the 1920s, he thought that um, all sentences were verifiable. And this is in accordance with Neo-Kantian philosophy. And uh, it's an outcome of um, the discussion about psychologism in the 19th century. Uh, where Neo-Kantianism Neo -Kantianism employed normativism to argue against psychologism in, in the theory of cognition. And uh, for them, it was a matter of fact that normativism was a, a theory which uh, took the art to be objective in, in a certain sense. Parece ser que perdimos la conexión con el profesor Karsten Heidman. Eh, profesor eh, Jorge Carrillo, ¿puede escucharnos? Fuerte y claro. Perdón, ya retomamos conexión eh, con Carsten Haven. Carsten. Yes. 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 Oh, just, just to finish. Um, so, so uh, well, both Hume and um, both Hume and Kant thought that uh, the ought has to be uh, distinguished from the is, and there is no way to derive an ought from an is, or an is from an ought. But Hume thought that ought sentences were not objective. Uh, Kant and the New Kantians thought that uh, ought sentences were objective. And this, this was followed by Kelsen in the 1920s when he, when he um, declared the legal norm to be a hypothetical judgment of legal cognition. Um, uh, but, well, in, in all phases, Kelsen also thought that there's no direct connection between is and ought even though a higher norm might make an is effect uh, into a condition for the existence of a legal ought. I hope I could be heard. Yes, Professor, we had a, we have, we had short problems, but by the end, everything what was quite clear. In fact, we have another question. Uh, which are the main obstacles that you find in front of this new reinterpretation of Hans Kelsen? Um, I think the main, you mean the, the new interpretation by grounding theory? Or yes. Which one? Yes. Why we, why we, we, uh, the reason why we, why we hit upon grounding theory to try to reconstruct um, the dependency relations which exist in the pure theory of law was simply because grounding theory is just now, while well, perhaps even the mainstream in uh, current metaphysics, in current philosophical metaphysics, and because uh, Kelsen uses terminology um, which, which comes close to the terminology of grounding theory. I think there are several problems. The first problem is that uh, grounding theory is a form of fundamentalism, which is a bit alien to the Neo-Kantian approach. 
And uh, there are also internal problems of grounding theory. Um, I think, I hope we, we could make it clear, this, this paradox of grounding, that on the one hand, it must be possible to infer the grounded element from the ground. Uh, and on the other hand, there must be some surplus uh, in the grounded element, which is which is well more than what is contained in the ground, and which is which makes it impossible to regard grounding just as a matter of uh, of reduction. Um, in Kelsen in Kelsen theory, this problem is uh, simply solved by um, having these dependency relations um, uh, depend on a higher norm, a kind of general norm, which which names criteria for something to ground something else. But the question is whether this criteria, which have to be named in some general law, which is responsible for the grounding relation, whether they do not, uh, whether they are not de de detrimental to the, to the notion of grounding itself, because it makes grounding depend on something else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for your participation. We hope having this kind of opportunity in the future and probably having the opportunity to translate your important work. Uh, maybe uh, your famous debate between you and Professor Stanley Paulson. And thank you very much again for, for this opportunity. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Tenemos una pregunta para el profesor Jorge Carrillo. Más bien una pregunta es una petición. ¿Podría explicarnos un poco más la influencia de Kant en Hans Kelsen, por favor? Es, es muy, muy complicada. Precisamente porque eh, Kant tiene una obra muy, muy extensa. Y concretamente, él va a hablar eh, en tono de la ética de aquello que es correcto para el ser humano. Se hace preguntas fundamentales. ¿Qué es lo que debo pensar? ¿O cómo debo pensar correctamente? ¿Qué es el ser humano? ¿Y cómo debo actuar? Respecto del cómo debo actuar, eh, va a generar varias obras, entre ellas... Eh, la Paz Perpetua, eh, Fundamentación Metafísica de las Costumbres y sobre todo la Crítica de la Razón Práctica. De entre todas estas obras, podemos resumirla concretamente en que él busca aquello que sea un imperativo eh, práctico y un imperativo categórico. El imperativo práctico pues es aquel que resulta válido pero no en toda situación. Es válido en la mayoría de las veces. Sin embargo, Kant va a buscar aquello que sea válido para todas las circunstancias, en todo momento y que sea plenamente atemporal, que rija directamente el ser humano y que sea perfecto. En ese sentido, va a encontrar dos imperativos categóricos. Eh, obra de tal forma que tu máxima de acción sea ley universal. ¿Qué significa? Hacer un ejercicio de proyección. ¿Qué pasaría si todos a mi alrededor o en todo el mundo actuaran de la misma forma en que yo estoy actuando? Si el resultado es beneficioso, pues entonces mi conducta es correcta. Si no lo es, entonces no lo será. Y el otro gran imperativo es eh, que las personas sean tú, que las personas no sean un medio, sino eh, ah, olvidé la, la palabra. Fin en sí sino tu fin, tu fin, finalidad. En ese sentido es eh, proyectado que el ser humano no debe valerse de las debilidades o fortalezas de los otros seres humanos, sino que debe de actuar conforme no se les cause ningún daño. Sobre esto eh, se van a derivar cuestiones, por ejemplo, para el ser humano es válido matar, para el ser humano es válido mentir, y Kant, llevándolo a extremos muy grandes, nos va a decir, no, aunque tu vida esté en riesgo, 
no debes mentir. Aunque tu vida esté en riesgo, no debes matar. Entonces, es una posición muy extremista y eh, metodológicamente, pues, hace una depuración de todo aquello que pudiera intervenir o pudiera afectar eh, la obtención de un concepto. Lo que hace Kelsen es básicamente eso, una depuración, una depuración de todo aquello que pudiera contaminar la concepción básica del derecho para dejarlo en su estado prístino. Eh, y además, encontrar a la norma jurídica con una aplicación de impera, imperativo categórico. Bajo esta idea, la idea de validez en Kelsen resulta algo secundario. ¿Por qué? Para Kant es importante el imperativo categórico porque está pegado a un valor ético. Para Kelsen no, porque no está provisto de un valor ético, sino que dependerá de su aplicabilidad. De ahí que la norma sigue siendo válida, se aplique o no. Aunque deja abierta la posibilidad de que si la norma nunca es aplicada, perdería un poco de su validez. Espero haber dado respuesta a lo increpado. Una, una respuesta eh, eh, plena, eh, copiosa, frugal, muy, muy amplia. Bueno, con, con esto damos concluido la sesión del día de hoy. Agradezco a la profesora Sara Laye, al profesor Karsten Heidman, a la profesora Mónica Zalepska, al profesor Matthews Pellegrino, al profesor Jorge Carrillo, y también a todos los asistentes, a todas las asistentes, en particular al profesor Carlos Rodríguez Manzanera. Las esperamos y los esperamos el día de mañana en la penúltima de las sesiones, en donde también tendremos ponentes de primer nivel. Thank you very much, Professor Saralagi, Karsten Haidman, Monica Zalewska, Matthews Pellegrino, Jorge, and see you soon. Thank you very much. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias, Mile. Chao. Gracias.